It was a Saturday at my environmental club. I saw my friends chatting, so I hurried over to join them. What about Walmart? Walmart? You guys hang out there? Can I come too? I love looking at wall stuff. Huh? Why was everyone gawping at me like an alien? Oh, Walmart! Duh, I was just fooling around. Anyway, you guys go have fun. There. You're probably thinking, has this girl been living under a rock? How can she not know what Walmart is? Well, now I do. Hi, I'm Jasmine, the only child of the biggest hotelier in New York. Growing up rich, I was used to lavish parties and being around wealthy families. That's how I met my girls, Katie and Ashley, daughters of my parents' business partners. I may have lived a privileged lifestyle, but I was actually happiest when I got to work in my art studio. I had an anonymous Tumblr account where I shared some of my finest oil paintings. There, I'd been talking to this one fan for a while. Daniel, he's such a hottie. And he loves art too. But best of all, I just found out we we're going to the same high school. Yay! So when the school year started, I asked to meet Daniel in person. Oh, that must be him! I was about to greet him when suddenly a girl appeared. Wow, there sure are a lot of rich girls around here. I swear I saw a few of them ogling you. Ugh, please. You know how I despise those spoiled princesses the most? I just can't stand being close to them. Oh no! Daniel hates rich girls? I can't let him see me today. Not like this. So I texted him saying something had come up. Over the next few days, I found out that Daniel was Mr. Cool with all the straight A's. Currently the president of the environmental club. And he's single. So that's Haley, just a close friend of his. I was determined to conquer Daniel's heart. I just needed to figure out a way to get around his whole anti-wealth thing. Aha! Uh -huh. I'd pretend to be some normal girl and join Daniel's environmental club. In the meantime, I'd make him fall for me before telling him the truth about my Tumblr account. Of course, I couldn't let Katie and Ashley know about this either. <laughs> and here I am, at the environmental club. I immediately approached Daniel with candies, but you know how terrible rappers are for the planet. Besides, Dan doesn't like sweets. At lunchtime, out of habit, I ordered fast food. But as I went to fetch it, I saw everyone gossiping amongst themselves about the terrible person who dared to order food in single-use plastic. Oh, silly me. I totally forgot I was in an environmental club. I quickly lied that I'd already eaten despite my stomach giving out some monster growls. And today's incident was yet another embarrassing moment I created for myself at the club. Oh, Walmart! Duh, I was just fooling around. Anyway, you guys go have fun! There! Learning to be a normal girly is hard, but dealing with my rich friends was even harder. I'd been so busy at the club I totally forgot I still had the recycling bag on me. Not mine! <laughs> Another time, I nearly got caught while trying to raise funds with other clubmates. I ended up hiding in the restroom for an hour straight. But all the suffering was worth it, as I got to hang around with Daniel. Daniel, I, um, I got this for you. Oh, this is for me? You're a great painter, aren't you? Thanks. By the way, meet Andy. He's in the Eco Bus Stop Poster Design Group, and you're going to work with him from now on. Not like a rich kid like him needs the bus. Andy, what are you doing here? I could say the same about you. My dad just married Daniel's mom, so I'm here to support my new stepbrother. Ooh, so Andy, whom I met through fancy parties with our parents in the past, was in Daniel's inner circle. This was wonderful news, so I confided in him all about my plan to get with Daniel. So, any chance you could help a girl out? Sure. I've always wanted Daniel to have a girlfriend anyway. He seriously needs to chill out a bit. <laughs> From then on, Andy started teaching me about the ordinary life. One time, he insisted on taking me to the amusement park for the first time. Why do people take the bus anyway? Why don't they just drive a car? Not everyone can afford a car, Jazz. So, when will the bus come to pick me up? The bus doesn't come to you. You have to go to the bus stop. Huh? A bus stop? What is it? It's a corner with a bench. You'll see. The bus was stuffy, and there was a funny smell coming from somewhere behind me. Where's my champagne and hot towels? Jazz, this is a bus, not a plane. You don't get those things here. Later, the bus suddenly jolted, and I flew forward. But Andy caught me in his arms. I peered up at him, and my heart almost skipped a beat. He looked so fine from this angle. Finally, we made it to the amusement park, and it turns out it was so much fun. I went on these twirling teacups until I felt dizzy and threw some balls at a tower of cans. On the way home, Andy insisted on joining this massive line to try some tacos. I'd never waited this long for food before. But oh boy, they were tastier than the Michelin star food. Best of all, Andy also helped me get close to Daniel. Only I got so nervous. 
the trees are leafy, aren't they? I mean, all trees are leafy. Apart from trees in the winter, as they're not very leafy. Hmm? <laughs> You're just the right combination of cute and awkward. <laughs> Holy moly. He thought I was cute. I was ready for my sweet first kiss when Haley butted in and started boring Daniel with talk of some project. Later that day, Haley pulled me into the corner. Who are you, and why join this club? I I'm I'm just an environmental enthusiast and a nature lover. Ah, this girl is everywhere, third wheeling with me and Daniel. But it's okay, as Andy had invited me to his house to work on a poster for the club. And I mean, I could conveniently bump into Daniel there too. <laughs> oh, some of the paintings here were amazing. I didn't realize Andy was an art fan. We discussed some of our favorite artists, and then I showed him my finest paintings on my Tumblr account. Wow, I can tell you truly have a knack for transitional blending. Actually, I dreamed of becoming an artist, but then Mom left me and Dad to travel the world and fill her own painting dreams. I didn't want to make Dad any sadder than he already was, so I stopped painting. I told him to pursue his passion no matter what, and invited him to join me in my art studio whenever he wanted. Suddenly, it was so hot in here, I needed a glass of water before I melted. I walked into the kitchen to find Daniel daydreaming out of the window. Hey, is everything all right? <sighs> Eco bus stop has hit a dead end due to the lack of funding. I knew I could just give him some of my allowance, but that would mean revealing that I was a rich girl. So I decided to cheer him up by pulling funny faces and said it would all be okay, but then... You don't understand. I have to make this project successful, no matter what. Only then I can get a scholarship into my dream university. His attitude stunned me. This Daniel was completely different from the fan I talked to. But maybe he was only acting up because Eco Bus Stop means a lot to him. So the next day, I decided to give Daniel his most wanted gift, an envelope with my monthly allowance. Just as I was about to reach Daniel, Haley stopped me. I know your secret already, rich girl. What? No! You must be dreaming stuff up. Oh, really? So you don't know these people? Aren't they the troublemakers from the rich kid clique? Yeah, they are. Why would I be friends with those spoiled brats? Spoiled brats? Jazz, how could you say that? Your whole Save the Trees act didn't work on me. You were acting fake from the start, so I followed you and saw you with your rich friends at the luxury outlet. That's correct. Jasmine Father owns more hotels than your dumb club members' houses combined. I don't know what she's doing here. Next thing I knew, Daniel walked off without saying a word, so I ran after him. I knew it so well that rich people like you ain't no good. You could have funded the project, or at least helped me ask your father for a loan, but you did nothing. You disgust me. I only did it because I like you! Right then, Katie and Ashley caught me up. I'm sorry for what I said earlier, girls. It was my fault. I shouldn't have said such nasty things about you guys. I didn't think a noble lady like you would ever lower yourself for a pity boy like him. If you want back in the clique, then cut ties with your low-rent friends. Maybe my club friends were right. We've been so shallow and materialistic. We should change, not them. You! How dare you, Jasmine! Jasmine! So, Daniel didn't want to see my face while Katie kicked me out of the group. For one week straight, I shut myself in my room. It was awful, but it did give me time to think more clearly and come to realize I should stop chasing Daniel. Instead, I want to be more active at the environmental club as I truly love contributing to the greater good. So, the next morning, I went to the beach cleanup with the club. Everyone looked so shocked to see me, especially Andy. You're back! I'm so glad you came. How have you been? Then we chatted happily while cleaning up the trash with everyone. Only Daniel and Haley were visibly annoyed, but I just couldn't care less. From then on, I was busy helping prepare for the Shark Tank show to raise capital for Eco Bus Stop. One day, Daniel approached me and apologized for overreacting that day. He went on to explain that his mom's been labeled a gold digger ever since she married Andy's dad. He wanted to show that, unlike Andy, who had been born into privilege, he didn't need money, and that he could get a scholarship into his dream college through Eco Bus Stop. Hearing this, I softened and forgave him. After that, we became friends again, and I think he was flirting with me. Hey, Jazz, you look nice today. You've got such beautiful eyes. But for some reason, every time I was with him, all I thought about was Andy. Time passed by, then came the Shark Tank qualifying round. The whole club nervously watched Daniel present the project. And guess what? Our project was selected for the final round! Right after that, Daniel followed me outside. Jasmine, will you be my girlfriend? I was so confused that I mindlessly nodded, but somehow, I didn't feel happy at all. On my first date with Daniel, I found my mind wandering back to Andy. Worse still, I felt like he was avoiding me. A few days later, I threw my 16th birthday. 
All my friends from the environmental club were there, except for Andy. Later, Daniel went on stage. Hey everyone, I prepared this special song for my girlfriend Jasmine. You say you're sorry, but it's too late now. So save it, get gone, shut up. Cause if you think I care about you now, girl, I don't give a fudge. Next thing I knew, everyone was gasping and giving me pitiful looks. So this is for you, Jasmine, you useless, rich, spoiled little brat. Happy birthday. You're dumped. I froze, but tried to pull myself together. Yes, I'm rich, but never useless and spoiled. People are more than just their social class, you know. Suddenly, I saw a fist flying through the air. It was Andy punching Daniel. You jerk. You'll pay for this. Then he leads me away. Andy sat me down on a bench, and I just couldn't stop my tears. Stop crying already. He doesn't deserve you. He never did. But I couldn't deal with this right now, so I turned and ran off without uttering a word. After crying myself to sleep that night, I knew the next day I had to be tough, so I returned to the club to get my stuff. Hey, I'm... I'm sorry about what happened last night. I never thought he could do such terrible things to you. And I'm sorry for being harsh on you this whole time. I know now that was wrong of me. It's okay. I guess it was just my fault from the start. I ignored the fact that we were incompatible just because he was my fan. Daniel is your fan? Yeah, from my Min Arts account on Tumblr. Oh god, that's you? I'm the fan, not Daniel. Oh, that makes sense. I guess I misunderstood everything all along. But why is there a photo and info of Daniel? Haley admitted to having a crush on Daniel. But now that I see his true colors, he's just not worth it anymore, you know? I'm gonna leave this club too. It's Daniel who needs to leave. Just wait and see. Despite still being in a mood, I showed up to Shark Tank's final round to see the project I contributed to. And yes, our Eco Bus Stop project finally got the funding approval. When suddenly... I'll invest in the project, but I don't want Daniel as my partner. I want it to be Haley, as she's the real mastermind behind this. All the club members shouted in union to support Haley and boo at Daniel. What about our deal? You said your father would invest in my project if I dumped Jasmine publicly. I don't know either. Maybe it's because you really suck. Moments later, Katie's father got between them. Fortunately, Andy filled me in on Haley's contribution to the project. Otherwise, I would have made a terrible mistake by funding an opportunist instead. As for you, Katie, how could you do that to a friend? You will receive your punishment at home. After the show ended, I went for a walk with Andy. So, this was your plan all along, huh? Daniel went too far this time. I need to teach him a lesson, and... Jazz, I've liked you since we first started hanging out, but I stupidly agreed to help you get with Daniel. I... I... This is so sudden! I don't know, Andy. I promise to take care of you from now on. Please give me a chance. Andy, actually... <sighs> I like you too, but my stupid self kept telling me to pursue Daniel, and all this time I've been thinking about you a lot, but I just need some time. That's all I need to know. Good night, good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be. Rio de Janeiro! The whole audience burst into laughter. What did I just say? Panicked, I checked the script again. Huh? It did say Rio de Janeiro. Ugh, I know she's behind it. Lisa, she must have messed with my script. Your prob's wondering why I didn't run down to the stands and give her a taste of my shoe? Well, it's complicated. You see, Lisa and I used to be best friends. When I was seven, my family moved to this town and Lisa was my neighbor. Back then, Lisa always seemed lonely as she didn't have any siblings. Her mom was busy with work and her dad was away on business. So I often came over to hang out with her and eventually we became the best of friends. We had so many things in common. Oh, and even her dad was a cop, just like my dad. Lisa never mentioned him, but I know she missed him. But then our 10 years of friendship was recently ruined just because of some boy. You see, Lisa liked this guy called Brent at school. So being the great friend I am, I tried to help. But Lisa found out that he'd been messaging me and thought that I was flirting with him behind her back. I tried to explain many times, but she refused to listen. So now, I became her reluctant enemy. Her sneaky tricks became commonplace. And on this occasion, she won. As she got the role of Juliet, while I was just a boring maid. On the day of the play, after finishing the final rehearsal, Lisa suddenly walked up to me and smiled. Sorry about the audition. 
I've been thinking about it a lot and realized how childish I was. Then Lisa handed me a bottle of my favorite juice to make up. Okay, that's strange. Does she have two completely different personalities inside her or something? Or did she realize how great of a friend I am not to resent her petty tricks? Anyways, seeing as it was her birthday and all, I happily took the bottle of juice and wished her good luck. However, 15 minutes before the performance, I had the worst cramping pains in my stomach, I sprinted at rocket speed to the bathroom, and by the time I got out of there, the show was pretty much over. And guess what? I hadn't had anything that day, except for the juice Lisa gave me. Unbelievable! She did it to me again! I then rushed into the lounge of the drama club and rummaged through Lisa's bag. Bingo! Inside was a bottle of laxatives. She put it in my drink so I couldn't participate in the show. Ex-best friend or whatever, there's no way I'm going to let her get away with it this time. Then suddenly, I found a vintage pocket watch sticking out from the innermost compartment of her bag. I held it in my hand and saw that the number 1999 was engraved on it. Why did it look so familiar? Don't touch my father's belongings! A voice sounded from behind me, and the next thing I knew, Lisa snatched the pocket watch from my hand. Why was she angry? I mean, I was the one who got done over, not her. And also, what did she mean by her father? I was still thinking about it when I arrived home, and suddenly saw someone sneaking around outside Lisa's house. Isn't that… dad? My dad looked around and then placed a beautifully wrapped gift in front of her door. It must be Lisa's birthday present, but why didn't he just hand it to her directly? When my dad came back inside, I quickly rushed over to him and asked, Hey dad, do you remember the pocket watch that you love so much? I haven't seen it for a while. Where did you put it? Dad seemed to be flustered by my question, then he muttered that he'd sold the watch to a pawn shop. I just nodded, but I knew he was lying, as he treasured that watch too much to ever sell it. Why did he give it to Lisa, then lie to me? Could it be that Lisa is my dad's illegitimate daughter? And the fact that my dad insisted on moving here, was it just so he could be close to his mistress and his child? Ugh! Lisa had stolen my role, and now she wanted to take my dad away from me too! I'd had enough. It's time for me to give her a taste of her own medicine. The next day at school, I made sure Lisa was watching as I flirted with Brent, then linked arms with him. <laughs> she looked like she was going to explode with anger. Then I told everybody in class that Lisa's father wasn't away on business and that she only said this as he had another family and abandoned her when she was little. The rumors must have gotten back to Lisa, as the next thing I knew, she was confronting me as I walked out of the toilet cubicle. How dare you say that stuff about my dad? You're a horrible liar! Then we ended up in a nasty hair-tugging fight. It was so bad, a teacher had to come in and pull us apart. Then the principal called our parents. Luckily for us, my dad and Lisa's mom decided not to make this a big deal because of our close neighborly relations. Yeah, as if. However, my dad still made me apologize to Lisa and her mom. Ugh. Dad, why do I have to apologize? It's not like she apologized to me for putting laxatives in my drink. You were wrong to spread those untrue rumors about her. But what were the laxatives about? I thought you two were friends. Since when did you guys become this resentful towards each other? I wasn't lying. They're the truth. Are you defending Lisa over me just because you feel guilty that she's your secret daughter? Christy, what did you say? I explained how I knew about the watch and therefore I'd figured out his secret. He was silent for a long time, then sighed and said, Actually, Lisa's dad was a colleague of mine. He was a good man who worked hard at his job. We had this difficult case involving a notorious criminal gang and, unfortunately, her dad passed away while on duty. In his last moments, he gave me his pocket watch as a memento and asked me to look after his four-year-old daughter, Lisa. Her mom and I couldn't break the heart of that little girl, so we said her father was away from home on business, and would return when she'd be 18 years old. As for me, I would pretend to be her father to occasionally send gifts and letters to her. When you and Lisa were seven, 
I decided to move here in order to easily take care of her. And as you know, I gave her that pocket watch. Her father's last memento. But why did you lie to her like that? Lisa was too young at that time to accept such an ugly truth. Her mom and I didn't have much choice either. I was expecting her to get used to it and stop waiting for her dad, but... It's true that we didn't expect things to be like this. On her last birthday, I continued to play the role of her father and left a present at the door with an apology for not being able to come home due to a busy schedule. But we know we can't keep this from her anymore. It's heartbreaking to see her longing for her dad so persistently. So, it turned out that all my speculations were wrong. Not only that, but I also spread false rumors and hurt my friend. Oh God, what had I done? How could I put this right? That night, I sent Lisa a long text apologizing, but she didn't reply. So the next morning, I waited at her door to go to school together, but she just walked straight past me. Looking at her distraught face, my heart filled with remorse. I just entered the school gate when someone tapped me on the shoulder. Wanna go see a play with me tonight? Brent held out two theater tickets. Oh, it was for the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. I was desperate to see that. Back when Lisa and I were still friends, we talked about going to see it. Wait, Lisa, that's right. So I lied to Brent that I was busy and told him to ask Lisa to go with him instead. Lisa looked so thrilled that Brent had asked her out. <sighs> now my conscience was clear. Lisa and Brent would realize they liked each other and finally get together properly. Then she'd forgive me, right? Anyway, I did have an essay coming up, so I went to a quiet coffee shop and studied there till late. But when I got home, I walked through the door to smashed up ornaments and the sound of my parents arguing. So you've been lying to me and Kirsty for all these years? How could you have a secret child the same age as your daughter? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? What's going on? Did she know about Lisa? I quickly ran to stop her. Mom, it's not what you think. I thought so too at first, but you have to listen to dad. Those lies may fool you, but they can't fool me. Lisa is his illegitimate daughter. That poor girl came here and told me. I tried reasoning with mom, but she was too upset to listen. With a slam of the door, she left. Dad plopped down on the couch and gave a solemn sigh. I sat next to him, comforting him that maybe it was Lisa's misunderstanding. Dad, we have to tell Lisa the truth. I'll approach her first to test the water, and then when she seems to be emotionally stable, you will come and talk to her, okay? The next day, as soon as I arrived at school, I immediately went to look for Lisa. There she was, standing by her locker with her arms folded. I walked over to her, but before I could say anything, she shouted, Stop acting as if you're that noble! I know Brent only invited me to the theater because you told him to. Why do you wish to embarrass me so much? Then Lisa burst into tears. If my dad was still alive, he would protect me from mean girls like you! I gaped at Lisa. She already knew everything? But if so... Why did she tell my mom the day before that my dad was also her dad? I stood there, refused to move until she told me the truth. Eventually, she blurted out that on her 18th birthday, she saw my dad leaving a gift in front of her house. Suspecting something was up, she mustered up the courage to ask her mom everything. It devastated her to learn that her long-awaited dad was just totally a made-up lie by my dad. She was full of rage towards my dad and me, so she lied to my mom so we'd know what it felt like to have a broken family. I was furious. How dare she do this to my family? But as she sobbed out an apology, my anger faded right away, and I only felt so sorry for her instead. What she had gone through was really unbearable. I hugged her tightly and the pair of us cried our eyes out. When we both calmed down, we decided to have a frank talk with our families. I told Lisa I didn't mind sharing my dad with her, as he loves her like his own daughter anyway. But in return, Lisa needed to apologize to my mom, 
and explain everything to her so she'd come back home. So finally, my mom has returned, and our two families are at peace again. I'm so sorry. I was out of my mind. I didn't mean to hurt you, Mom. Oh, I mean, Mrs. Lamont. Everyone burst out laughing. I also took the opportunity to give Lisa's mom a big hug and called her my mom, just like Lisa did. We were all chatting away happily when the doorbell rang. Lisa and I both went to open the door and saw Brent standing there holding a bouquet of flowers. He had this bewildered look on upon seeing us both here. But you know what? It doesn't matter which one of us he was looking for. There's no need for a boyfriend right now, because I already have my best friend right here. Or should I say, my sister? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Something really important. I have acrophobia, so this is my idea of a nightmare. I don't want to be here at all. Oh, and that guy on the other side is Charlie, he's my boyfriend, but I don't actually like him like that. So you're probably wondering how I ended up here, 200 meters above the ground and about to make this terrifying leap? Well, let's just start from the beginning. Hi, I'm Luna, a 17-year-old high school girl from a small town in New South Wales. Growing up, I was desperate to please my hardworking single mom. The problem was she was nearly always tired and irritable. So, no matter what I said or did, it usually ended up being wrong. The most common words that came out of her mouth were, If you want me to love you, you have to be nice. I wanted her to love me more than anything else in the world, so I did everything I could to appease her. This led to the need to make everyone happy, and left me with an unfathomable fear of being hated by others. If I made other people happy, then they'd like me, right? So, whenever someone asked me to do their homework or cover for them on roll call, I did so without hesitation. And if there's ever an argument or awkward situation, regardless of if I'm to blame or not, I always apologize first. At 15, I moved to Sydney alone for high school, and that's when I met my roommate Margot. She's my complete opposite, but this didn't stop us from becoming best friends. She's independent, sassy, and doesn't let anyone pressure her into doing anything she doesn't want to. Guys, if I were more like her, I would have been able to avoid a lot of trouble. Once we had a group assignment in biology, and I, by chance, teamed up with these two popular girls. The day before the deadline, they both texted me, saying they were sick, and asked me to do their parts. This was a lot of work for one person, but I didn't want to upset them, so I agreed. But then, that night, while I was scrolling through Instagram during my brief break after hours of studying, I saw them checking in at a party. What? So they lied to me so they could go out and have fun, and left me home alone to do their homework? Oh my, I just want to take this pen and throw it right at their dumb duck faces. How was that cute in any way? Ugh, but who was I kidding? I knew full well I'd never be able to tell them what I really thought of them. So I picked up the pen and continued my workload meant for three people alone. I stayed up all night and drank three cans of energy drinks, but it was just too much work for one person to finish on time. Our assignment, or should I say, my assignment, got points deducted due to late submission, which somehow made the popular girls mad. What have you done? How could you turn in the assignment late? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just that doing it all by myself was a bit too much for me. Oh, please. You had the whole day to finish it. It's all down to your poor time management. Right at that moment, Margot appeared out of nowhere and stepped between us. Pfft. If you both cared so much about your grades, then you would have helped Luna complete it. Instead of going to some stupid party, how about I report you to the teacher to cross out your names from Margot? Enough. Sorry, don't mind her. Then I quickly pulled Margot away. Apologizing to them was a ridiculous thing to do. It wasn't your fault. I, I know it's not my fault, but, but there's no point making a scene out of it, right? Fine, in that case, I'll leave you alone with all the troubles you've caused yourself. I don't care anymore. Oh, no, I I didn't mean to make Margot mad. I quickly apologized to her, told her she was my best friend in the whole world, and asked her to go for a milkshake to make up. A week later, on the day my volunteer club was selling lemonade to raise funds for a children's charity, I suddenly fell sick. Oh no, I had been telling everyone at the club how important this event was, but now I was the one who'd be absent. How embarrassing! I needed to show them how sincere I was. I texted the club president that I was sick, but if the club really needed me, 
I could still try to participate. Ah, <sighs> now I can finally sleep. But who would know? Before I even had time to curl up in bed, he texted back saying how they really needed my help. So if I could come, that'd be great. Oh, no. Did I really have to drag my feverish self over there? Not knowing what to do, I turned to Margot for advice. But she snapped at me. If you knew you couldn't go, why suggest otherwise? People will always take advantage of you if you let them. So just make it clear that you're sick and can't participate. Then she told me how her music club had a dinner meeting tonight, yet she'd already decided she was having a relaxing pamper session tonight, so she immediately told them she was otherwise engaged. Ugh, Margo was right. If I'd done as she said in the first place, I wouldn't have had to rack my brains looking for excuses to say no without annoying anyone. Finally, I texted the club president that I was afraid of infecting everyone so I'd better stay home. Then I fell asleep and found my worries plaguing my dreams. The next day, I felt better. So after class, I dropped by the club's room, but I instantly felt weird vibes from everyone. Then when I asked the club president how much money we'd earned from the event, he totally blanked me. Oh no, he was obviously still mad with me for letting him down. I was lost in thoughts when suddenly someone tapped me on the shoulder. I heard you were sick. Are you feeling better now? It was Charlie, one of the club members. He told me that day I was off sick. He voluntarily took over all of my work. So I invited him out for a thank you dinner right away. Hmm. Maybe he misunderstood my goodwill jester, as after that he bombarded me with texts, calls, and soppy memes. Then one day while we were walking together, Charlie suddenly stopped and took my hand. Luna, we've known each other for a while now. I think it's time for me to confess my feelings. I, I like you. Will you go out with me? Oh my. What did he just say? I stood there dumbfounded. I mean, I liked him as a friend, but not romantically. But when I met his expectant gaze, my conscience began to torment me. He was such a nice guy, so how could I say no to him? In the end, I, I forced a smile and nodded in agreement. My feelings for him will develop over time, right? But unfortunately, the answer to this was no. Actually, since we started dating, I found myself liking him even less than before. He does a lot of things that irritate me, such as the time he insisted we wear couple outfits to school. Yeah. Slogan shirts with he's mine, she's mine printed on them should definitely be left in 2010. Ugh. He smugly ushered me around the school and seemed oblivious to the laughs and points in our direction. If only the ground could just open up and swallow me right away. That evening, noticing how fed up I looked, Marco asked me if everything was going all right between me and Charlie. So I told her everything. I thought she'd get mad at me again, but to my surprise, she just sighed and told me to tell the truth and break up with Charlie before things got too serious. That's the best way to stop both of us from getting hurt. And also, I've heard a lot of bad things about Charlie. People say he's kinda erratic. You better get this over with as soon as possible. Yeah, Margot's right. Next time I saw Charlie, I was ending this once and for all. Turns out I didn't have to wait long, because that Sunday afternoon, Charlie came to pick me up for our date. He told me he had a surprise in store for me, and I was gonna love it. Okay, it sounds like he'd gone to loads of effort, so it was probably best if I left breaking up with him until the journey home. Almost there! Hearing what Charlie said, I looked out the window and- Oh my god! Is that a bungee jumping spot? So, long story short, here I am, 200 meters off the ground, my legs trembling like a leaf and my heart thudding like crazy. I was about to cry out of fear when suddenly I heard romantic music playing behind me. I turned around to see Charlie getting down on one knee. Behind him was eagle-eyed staff holding roses and candles while swaying to the music. Um, what's happening? I know we haven't been dating long, but it's clear that we're made for each other. Luna, will you marry me? What? Did I hear him wrong? I mean, I'm only 17. Seeing my puzzled look, Charlie hurriedly said, I know we're still in high school, but don't worry, we can wait till graduation. Then let's have the most wonderful wedding straight after that. This was insane. I stood there, rooted to the floor, not knowing what to do, and seeing everyone watching and waiting made me feel even more pressured. I was trying to figure all this out when Charlie forced the ring on my finger. Oh my god. What should I do? What should I do? Well, in classic me fashion, I didn't do anything. My stupid hand just froze in place, and in the end, it turned out like this. No, no, I, I couldn't let this happen. Charlie, actually, I... I... um... I don't have feelings for you. I, I was going to tell you today, but I, I didn't expect things to end up like this. You're kidding me, right? 
If you didn't like me, you wouldn't have let me put the ring on earlier. So I explained everything to Charlie. His face darkened with disappointment. I felt so guilty. I should have just been straight with him from the beginning, then none of this would have happened. We can still be friends, can't we? I asked, but Charlie replied without even looking at me. If you don't like me, then why give me hope? Why the emotionless tone? It felt like he'd turned into a completely different person. Af afraid, I, I kept quiet, not daring to blurt out so much as a word. I'd be home soon and away from this suffocating atmosphere. But as Charlie drove, I noticed how the surroundings became stranger and stranger. This is definitely not the way to the dormitory. Finally, the car stopped at an abandoned construction site. Luna, get out of the car. Sensing his irritable tone, I did as he said. You can stay here until you figured out that we're destined for each other. Then call me. I watched in horror as he drove away and left me there. I was all alone, in the middle of nowhere. Panicked, I called Margot for help, but as soon as she picked up, my phone ran out of power. I explored the area, but it was completely deserted. Would I be stuck here forever without anyone knowing? It was getting late. I'd barely eaten or drank anything all day, and this felt hopeless. I burst into tears, and then everything fell dark around me. I woke up to the bright lights of the hospital. Margot jumped in to give me a hug, then explained what had happened. Turns out that night after I called her, she checked my location on Snapchat and saw that I was in some deserted place. Sensing something was off, Margot and the dormitory manager went to find me and took me to the hospital. Charlie was disciplined and detained for a month for the trouble he'd caused. After that horrible experience, I talked a lot with Margot. She comforted me, encouraged me, and said that it seemed like my desire to please others stemmed from childhood trauma. Perhaps it was my mother's words. If you want me to love you, you have to be nice. That created the character I have now. I couldn't continue to let the past consume me. That summer, when I returned home to see my mom, together, we poured out our feelings and faced our problems. I finally figured out that being nice to people wasn't a bad thing, but agreeing to things just to avoid disappointing people isn't the correct thing to do at all. Now, with Margot's help, I'm step by step learning to say no to things I don't want to do. Cause life's way too short to say yes to everything. Don't you think? This was my first day at my new school, and so far, it was going pretty well. Can you believe the principal himself was giving me the guided tour, as well as showering me with praise? Amber, with your impressive grades and outstanding academic achievements, you'll fit in nicely here. This is Leo, my son. He's another excellent student here, and he's going to show you around. Leo looked at me from head to toe, then smiled and winked at me. Huh? Was he checking me out? And here's the library. Maybe we could study here together sometime. Um, sorry, but I prefer to study alone. Right at that moment, a guy walked past us to the librarian's desk. Oh. My. God. He totally had this whole cool bad boy look going on. I zoomed in to see what book he was holding. The Orion Mystery? Wow. Nice taste. I've been really into ancient stuff these days, too. Leo must have noticed me staring at that guy, as he snidely said, I'd steer clear of the likes of him if I was you. His grades are pathetic, and he's probably only in here so he can take a nap. He's below your league, while I'm far more suitable. Thanks for showing me around, but seeing your smug and scornful attitude towards others proves otherwise. Then I left, leaving a stunned-looking Leo behind. I found my class easily enough, even without Leo's help. And my desk? Yeah, there was no missing that. I mean, the huge bouquet with my name on it and a welcome hamper full of candy was a dead giveaway. And apparently, it was from the principal. Whoa. I knew he was glad I was here, but wasn't this a bit too much? Anyway... I shared all the flowers and candies with my classmates to get to know them better. So far so good, and these two sweet girls Jane and Ellie walked to the canteen with me and showed me how to get the lunch tray using my student QR code. But then they pointed over to a group of students sitting next to the window and told me to go sit with them. Huh? Why can't I sit with you? You're not one of us. Then they went and joined another group. What did they mean by that? I looked around and noticed there were two menus, 
a delicious looking one on the red board, and a bland one on a blue board. Hmm. It seemed the boards correlated to the trays, as more kids than not had the blue trays with the dull foods. I took my red tray full of tasty food and walked over to the window, where all the kids were sitting with red trays, including Leo. Hmm. There's something really strange about this school. I was pretty awkward and didn't know what to do when I saw the Orion Mystery Boy walking in with a blue tray. So, without thinking, I approached him. I saw you this morning in the library. You were checking out my favorite book. So, should I return the book or what? No, no, I just want to make friends. Stop hanging out with this loser. A straight A student like you should sit with us. We're different. See? This was so stupid. So I told Leo I didn't need colored trays to tell me who I could and couldn't talk to, and that I was fully capable of making my own mind up. Leo and his friends looked furious, while the Orion mystery boy just grinned. Suddenly a girl in the group spoke up with a super cold tone. Don't worry, Leo. This new girl will soon figure out what losers they are. Then she signaled for the whole group to leave. After that, the Orion mystery boy and I started talking, and he finally told me his name. It's John. Hmm. The blue tray kids were really nice. Way nicer than the red tray ones. I asked John what the deal with the trays was, and he said that this school divided its students into two groups. The red were top achievers, and therefore got better food, cleaner spaces at the canteen, just everything while the blues were made to eat bland food and squashed into the corner of the canteen. Poof, this whole thing was dumb. So I continued hanging out with John and his friends. Only Leo and that girl he was with, Quinn, didn't approve. Turns out she's the best student around here and that made her the leader of the Reds. On many occasions, Quinn and her minions had pulled me aside after class to tell me I should stay away from the blues. But I didn't care. Then one day, the school announced that it was looking for the next school president. I wasn't that interested in it, but my friends were eager for me to sign up. If you're president, then you could make things fairer around here. Right, better food, better tables and chairs. Please, we need you. Well, they did have a point. I really wanted them to have better things. And I suppose being school president would look good on my profile. So, I signed up. But, wow, I didn't think I'd be this popular. My friends completely supported me, made colorful banners and helped me come up with catchy slogans. And you know what? In the end, I got to the final round. Whoop! Now all I had to do was beat Quinn. But then, something awful happened at the school. I arrived to find a bunch of students gathered around something. I squeezed through the crowd and... Oh my god... The principal's beloved portrait was covered in red paint. Then across the loudspeakers, two names were called to the principal's office. John's and mine. Do you two know why I've summoned you here? John and I shared confused looks. No, huh? My portrait has been vandalized, and I know that Amber, you were the last one who passed the security guard yesterday. And John... You were caught on CCTV climbing over the back gate. Can you both please explain what you were doing so late at school? I couldn't find my math book and I have an important math test coming up. So I came back to try and find it. And what about you, John? I knew it. An exemplary student such as Amber would never do such a thing. But a troublemaker like you, on the other hand, you're expelled. I didn't do it. Please reconsider, sir. Please give me some time so I can find the one who's responsible. Very well. Seeing as it's you, Amber, I shall allow you one week to prove this boy's innocence. Him, or his guilt. When we left the office, I asked John why he was sneaking about the school late at night. But he got all defensive. I had a thing, and it's none of your business. If you want to believe it was me, then do. Didn't you see what I just did? I defended you. Can't you just tell me? I had a thing, okay? My thing that you don't need to know. Then he left. I stood there feeling confused when Quinn, Leo, and their group walked towards me. 
Don't waste your time with him. Sooner or later, he's gonna be expelled. Right, Quinn? But Quinn ignored him, then gave me a dagger look. I'm gonna say this one last time. Stay away from him. Then they all left. Hmm. Why was Leo so sure that John would be expelled? I know they all hated John, especially Quinn. Could it be that they framed him? Well, there's only one way to find out. I needed to keep a close eye on Quinn and see what she was up to. So after school, I followed Quinn all the way to the harbor. Hmm, it's like she was waiting for someone. Um, what on earth are you doing? My god, I had to press my hands over my mouth so I didn't start screaming. Turns out he noticed that I was following Quinn, so he followed me too in case I do something stupid. Suddenly, Quinn took her phone out to call someone. But then a strange thing happened. John's phone started vibrating. Um, why is Quinn calling you? John took his phone out and showed me the screen. It's just my mom. And when I turned around to see what Quinn was doing, she'd gone. Ugh, I lost her. I've been following Quinn for a whole week, but it's led to nothing. <sighs> I was so deep in my thoughts that I accidentally dropped someone's backpack and all their stuff fell out. Ugh, it's Quinn's. Better pick everything up before she comes back. But then I saw something that caught my attention. It was a receipt for... Red paint. Jackpot. I knew it was her. John was skipping classes today, so I took a detour to his house after school to tell him. Huh? Why was Quinn standing outside his door? There was something seriously fishy going on here, so I followed them. They stopped at an abandoned house nearby, and I eavesdropped on their conversation. I think Amber knows something. Last time, we were lucky she didn't catch us dating at the harbor. But this time, what if she finds out? I've been working so hard for this school president campaign. I knew she'd go back for her math book. It would have been fine if the school didn't have that new camera at the back gate. Tomorrow, I will confess to the principal that I did it. You didn't do it yourself anyway. Oh god, I couldn't believe it. Turns out, Quinn was meeting John at the harbor, so when she called someone, it was actually him. But being an expert at this secret dating game, he had her number saved as mom. They were hiding their relationship this whole time. And worse, they tried framing me so Quinn would win the election. Unbelievable! I couldn't stay quiet any longer, so I stepped out in front of them, told them I'd heard everything and that I was gonna tell the principal. Then I ran off without letting them say a word. The next day, I was en route to the principal's office when I passed Quinn tearing down her election posters on the wall. Why are you doing that? It's okay. I know I don't deserve to be school president. Hmm. I thought you wanted to be president more than anything in the world. Why else would you play dirty tricks on me? So, Quinn explained to me that she was running for school president to eliminate the discrimination here, so that she didn't have to hide her relationship with John any longer. Oh wow, I didn't know. I didn't expect her to have such a meaningful motive behind all this. My plan was just to fight for better things for the Blues team. But man, Quinn had a vision to change this whole school. Impressive. And there's one more thing. Since you're the principal's favorite student, we were afraid that if you become school president, despite your best efforts, things here would only get worse. So there was no other way for us. We had to. I'm sorry. It seems like I misjudged Quinn, and I didn't want John to get expelled, so I said that I'd take the blame for the portrait incident. But it's all my fault. You don't need to do that. No worries. I'm sure to ace the math test and win a prize for the school, so there's no way he's gonna punish me. So at recess, I was heading to the principal's office, but before I could get there, I found myself being dragged into the janitor's closet. Oh, it was John. He was feeling guilty and didn't want me to take the fall. I was about to reply to him when I heard two familiar voices in the science room next to us. It was Quinn and Leo. Oh my god, we could hear them clearly through the ventilation hole. <laughs> I can't believe it worked. 
Amber is such a fool. There's no way she'll be allowed to run for president and victory will be mine. So, are you really gonna remove the division between the two groups just to freely date your stupid boyfriend in public? <laughs> are you fooled by that too? Of course I won't. No way! That was only to trick Amber and John. What I'm gonna do is make sure all troublemakers are gonna be kicked out of school. What? I got played? Again? Ugh! I turned to John and, oh man, he looked disappointed. Don't worry, I know a way to get back at them. On election day, Quinn gave her speech, and unsurprisingly, she went on about how the Red Group brings more to the school and therefore deserves their privileges. She really believes she could make a fool out of this Amber, huh? When I stepped out on the stage, her jaw dropped. Yeah, Quinn, I didn't confess to the principal. Giving speeches in front of a crowd wasn't something new to me, so I was super confident. I'm sure you're all aware of how this school operates. We're divided into two groups and get treated very differently. What I see here is discrimination and prejudice, when in reality, this should be a safe place for all students to strive and reach their full potential. So I'm standing here today to tell you that if you choose me to be your next school president, I will break the barrier. Let's say goodbye to red and blue trays and hello to fairness and equality. After my speech ended, the crowd went wild. Wow! And surprisingly, some of the Red Group were cheering me too. Hmm, you're probably wondering why I didn't expose Quinn in front of the whole school, right? As I see it, she'd had a massive reality check, so I think that was enough. I also spotted the principal quietly sneaking off with his head down, in the midst of cheers the whole school gave me. Could you guess who won? Yeah, me of course. <laughs> John came on stage and handed me flowers in front of a furious looking Quinn. I walked towards her and whispered, Let's see how you're gonna get rid of the troublemakers now. She just sneered at me, then stormed off the stage. Later, we heard that Quinn confessed all to the principal. Then she transferred to another school. What about me? Well, after I became school president, I stuck to my promise and began making some serious changes to the unfairness of the school. And John, did we become a couple you ask? Oh no, we're just close friends. <laughs> what a beautiful day. Guess who just landed the lead role in the musical club's next play? Yep, me. As I immersed myself in the rhythm of the music, ouch, I bumped into someone and fell over. Are you blind? You think you're so special you can just waltz around the places you please? Not again. Why do I keep running into her? That's Kiera, the mean girl from my musical club. I sing, she dances, I always make sure to stay in my lane, but for some reason, Kiera won't stop criticizing me. Ugh, please, you sound like a screeching cat. Give me fingernails on a chalkboard over your squawking any day. Why she gotta be so mean? Huh? What's this? Oh, a wallet. Someone must have dropped it. But I'm the only person in this alley. There must be an ID card or something in it, right? So I opened the wallet to check it, but nope. No student card, no ID. Instead, there's just a strange photo and a bunch of VIP membership cards with the name Sophia on them. Ooh, these places are swanky. This person must be super wealthy. I gotta hand this into the cop station. But wait. Isn't this... Oh my god, a ticket to see Franz Ferdinand tonight! I love that band! And it's for the VIP area! Hmm, even if I bring this to the cops now, they still won't be able to find the owner before the concert anyway. We shouldn't let such an awesome ticket go to waste, right? So, what if... I'll enjoy tonight's concert on this girl's behalf, then I'll hand the wallet to the cops later. Honest! Wow. This is the biggest stage I've ever seen in my life! I got to my seat and eagerly waited for the show to start when I heard a voice next to me. Hey, you must be Sophia. My gosh, this guy was gorgeous! But he'd mistaken me for someone else. Wait a minute. That's right. Sophia was the name on the cards. The wallet's owner. I was still looking for a way to explain this awkward situation when he continued. Glad to meet you. 
I'm Roman, and I've heard a lot about you from my parents. They're kind of good at arranging things, aren't they? Because I really admire this band. I should have foreseen this happening. I mean, who goes to a concert alone? Luckily for me, it appears that this Roman guy had never met the real Sophia before. For one night only, I could pretend to be her, right? And guess what? The guy was not only super cute, but also a talented musician. He'd spent most of his life in Italy and had not long returned to the US to attend college here. Through him, I learned that Sophia was a gifted singer and both their parents set this meeting up so that Roman could help her singing career. Talking to Roman felt so natural and soon I was singing and swaying to the music alongside him. As soon as I arrived home, I immediately went online to find more information about Roman. Wow, his SoundCloud account has over 200,000 subscribers. <sighs> Handsome and talented, he's like a James Dean of modern times. As I was daydreaming, my phone vibrated. He texted me. I had a great time tonight. I'm having a small welcome home party at the Madison Club. I heard you go there often. If you're not busy, would you like to join us? The Madison Club? As in, one of the most expensive country clubs in the state? The initiation fee alone costs a thousand dollars, and this girl is a frequent flyer? And, yup, here's the Madison Club VIP membership card. I know, I know. But I still had loads of music-related questions to ask Roman. Just this once. Then I would definitely hand it in. Now, on to the next problem. I couldn't wear these mediocre outfits to the Madison Club. I needed something demure but expensive looking. Hmm, if I was Sophia, where would I shop? Yes, the Crystal Lane Mall. The next morning, I strolled up to the exclusive shopping mall with all of my savings. But how can a dress this short cost $5,000? Are there actually people who are willing to pay that much for this tiny fabric? The only item I could afford was a sparkly hairpin. So be it. I gritted my teeth, taking the hairpin to the checkout counter, along with all the cash I had on me and the membership card. But surprisingly, not only did I get the hairpin for free, but they also gifted me this cute bag. Apparently it was my birthday. Well, Sophia's birthday to be exact. Honestly, I felt kind of guilty enjoying these services in Sophia's name, but I didn't spend any of her money. Seeing as this bag's a freebie, I get to keep it, right? The next day, I settled on a simple but pretty dress and my beautiful new bag and wore them to school, as I planned to go straight from there to the party. When my best friend Anna came over to me, she took one look at my bag, then <gasps> gaped in disbelief. A Chanel bag? Did you sell a kidney to buy it? <laughs> it was a gift. Uh, where did you get that? That's a limited edition for VIP members of the Crystal Lane Mall only. Spill it. It's a fake, yeah? Kiera and her unruly friends were at it again. I tried to pull Anna away as I didn't want any trouble, but she still managed to clap back at them. It's 100% authentic. Maisie's rich boyfriend got it for her. Jealous much? Kiera sneered, then said unless I called my boyfriend over, she would tell the whole school that we were tragic liars. Come on, Maisie. Show them what humiliation feels like. Oh no, what should I do? Thanks to Anna's expectant looks and Kiera's smug grin, I had no choice but to ask Roman to pick me up after school. Um, he says he'll come get me after class. As soon as I stepped out of the school gate, I saw Roman waiting next to a shiny Bugatti Chiron. He greeted me with a smile, then opened the door for me. I didn't need to turn around to know that Kiera was watching me with fiery eyes. After this, she wouldn't dare to look down on me again, right? Ooh, this place was even more lavish than I imagined. As we were early, Roman invited me to sing a song while he played the piano. I started singing, and he too joined in to harmonize, and this moment felt just great. How cool was it seeing him all immersed in music? By the time we finished our performance, I realized a crowd had gathered around us, and they all burst into wild applause. An angelic voice and a genius musician. What a perfect couple. I turned to Roman and saw him smiling fondly at me. Wow, I knew my parents said you were good, but I had no idea you'd be that incredible. Feeling my face heating up, I quickly excused myself, then ran to the bathroom, well, once I could find it, to calm down. Yeah, so this was a confusing mess, 
but it didn't change the fact that my heart was still thudding like crazy. This experience was like daydreaming, but maybe I should tell him the truth before things went too far. I returned to see Roman talking with a girl. Seeing me coming, Roman waved me over and said, Here she is. Hey, Sophia. I've just been chatting with your little sister. Oh no, I was going to tell Roman the truth myself, but when the girl turned around and isn't that Kiera? So Kiera is my, I mean, Sophia's sister? Kiera seemed as surprised as I was as she made up an excuse and left. Huh, did she really just leave without making a scene? The next day, I turned up at school with the wallet and looked for Kiera, only I couldn't find her anywhere. When the last bell rang, I received a message from her that said, Meet me in the alley behind school. I nervously arrived at the rendezvous spot and saw Kiera waiting there. Here's your sister's wallet. Sorry I didn't return it sooner. But to my surprise, she didn't even take the wallet. Thief, you'll pay for that. What did she mean by that? Let me be clear, I didn't steal this. I just picked it up by accident. I was always going to hand it in. Then why did you use my sister's name and membership cards? I just, no more excuses, stealing is still stealing. If you don't want everyone, including Roman, to know that you're an identity thief, you'd better do what I say. You will sing for me to lip sync at the city's upcoming singing contest. Singing contest? But Kiera's a dancer, not a singer. Suddenly, a voice from behind startled me. Here you are, Sophia. I've been looking for you. I turned and saw Roman's happy, oh so cute face. He'd be so gutted when he found out that I'd lied to him from the start, sensing my feelings. Kiera just smirked at me before she left. Remember our deal, sister? It turned out that Roman had just finished composing a new song that day and wanted me to record a demo for it at his studio. But this isn't right. I hesitated, then blurted out, Roman, actually, I'm not. Roman interrupted before I could finish my sentence and showed me the poster of an upcoming singing contest. Oh, it was the one Kiera mentioned earlier. You should give it a try. It's a good opportunity. I shook my head sadly, but I can't. Why? How can I tell Roman that I can't participate in the contest because I have to help Kiera lip sync? So I just told him some baloney about having a family thing on that day. When I got home, I decided there's only one thing for it. I had to block Roman. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but I had to stop this web of lies now before they overtook my life. On the day of the singing contest, Although I'd pre-recorded the song for Kiera, she still dragged me along with her. Hmm, that's odd. She didn't seem her usual brash self. Maybe the nerves had got to her? Then, midway through her performance, she misjudged a move and her mic clattered to the floor. As she was standing there dumbfounded, my voice continued to blast out. The whole room fell silent. Then slowly, the murmurs began to rise. Everyone pointed and commented on Kiera, and I heard the man sitting next to me muttering, She's brought more shame on our family. How could I tell anyone that's my daughter? Oh, so this is Kiera's father? And the woman sitting next to him, probably her mother, was also shaking her head in boredom. At that moment, a staff member approached them to say something, and I could see their faces turn pale before they rushed out of the auditorium. Seeing that, Kiera burst into tears, then rushed off the stage. Geez, how can parents treat their child like that? Kiera may have been a mean girl, but she didn't deserve that. I was about to go check if she was okay when a hand pulled me back. It was Roman. Maisie, it's your turn. Right at that moment, the host of the show called me to the stage by my real name. Huh? What was going on? I turned to look at Roman, but grinning, he just wished me luck and handed me the mic and the music started. It was the song that Roman and I had sung together. I took a deep breath to calm myself, then sang my heart out. When I ended the performance, all three judges stood up to applaud, and the audience cheered me on. Oh dear, am I dreaming? What is all this? Do you know who I really am? Yeah, of course. I figured that out ages ago. Turns out me not knowing where the restrooms were in the country club gave the game away. <laughs> so he did his research and found out that I wasn't actually Sophia. Only because he still wanted to see me, he pretended not to know so we could carry on like normal. 
He also accidentally witnessed Kiera making me sing for her performance, so he decided to register me. Talking about Kiera, I wanted to make sure she was okay. We searched around and found her sitting outside, sobbing. It's okay. There will be other competitions. I'm not upset about that. It's my sister. She's missing. Through tears, Kiera told us about how from a young age, her parents wanted her and her sister to pursue a career in music. However, Kiera found a love of dance, while Sophia excelled at singing, making her favorable to their parents. Regardless of how many dance contests Kiera won, they always overlooked her talent. Then, when she excitedly told them that she'd bagged the lead dance role in the school play, they just went on about Sophia instead. So, feeling disheartened and jealous, Kiera threw away her sister's wallet, the one that I accidentally picked up that day. In this singing contest, Kiera wanted to win against her sister in front of their parents for once, so she got me into this whole lip-syncing plan of hers. But last night, Sophia found out about it, and they had an argument. Then, in anger, Kiera blurted out nasty things, such as how she longed for Sophia to vanish from her life. Only that morning, she woke up and found that her sister had actually gone. Until now, Sophia still hadn't even shown up at the auditorium when it's soon going to be her turn to perform. What if Sophia never comes back? I shouldn't have been so mean. Roman and I comforted Kiera. Then we went to find Sophia together. Kiera took us to Sophia's fave places, but she was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly, I remembered the picture carefully inserted inside her wallet. This must be a special place for her. This is my family's old house. We used to live here when I was little. We rushed over there and found Sophia sitting idly in front of the house. The two of them ran into each other's arms and sobbed like two children. Through tears, they talked it all out. Turns out, while Kiera was jealous of her sister, Sophia didn't have it any better either. She has been pressured by their parents' expectations since forever, and she did always feel sorry for Kiera because of all the privileges she had. You know, you can't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. If singing is your passion, feel free to live it to the fullest. But if it's not, don't be afraid to pursue what makes you happy. I mean, you're actually a really awesome dancer. So, in the end, Sophia and Kiera made up. After a big fight with their parents, the two sisters were free to pursue their own passion. Kiera focused on dancing, while Sophia and her friends formed an indie band like she always wanted. As for me, well... I've learned a lesson that if you find a lost item, take it to the cop station immediately. Luckily for me, it hasn't turned out so bad. I helped two sisters find peace, and even got myself this handsome, super talented musician. I'm standing in the middle of the room, wearing this extravagant dress and a glittery mask. All eyes are on me, but I can sense how ingenuine they are. This is supposed to be my sweet 16th, and yet all of these guests were complete strangers. Ugh, it's all that slimeball Gregory's fault. Actually, this OTT party was all down to him. Oh, hi, I'm Vivian, but my friends call me Viv. My mom, Jacqueline Mars, is one of the wealthiest people on Earth. So, I grew up thinking massive mansions, gigantic pools, and a floor entirely for toys was the norm. Well, at least I did until I turned 10. That day I was playing in my life-size dollhouse when I heard talking coming from the other side of the fence. I peeked over it and saw a woman and a girl around my age who looked kind of weird. Curious, I spoke up. Hey you, why do you dress so funny? Pardon? What did you say? You don't even have shoes on. That's so silly. You're the silly one. Bet you've never tasted this before, huh? So try it. Spoiled rich kids like you always look down on others. While in fact, you're no use to society. I just stood there dumbfounded as the security shooed them away. I never meant to offend her. I, I was just curious. So I rushed inside the house to find mom and ask her about this. Oh, honey, not anyone can be as wealthy as we are. That means you don't have to worry about a thing, sweet pea. Now go play so mommy can work, okay? Even to this day, mom's words still linger in my ears. 
I've grown to resent my family's wealth. I just wanted to be a normal kid. That's why, by the time I got to middle school, I convinced mom to let me transfer from my private school to a public one and wipe out everything about me online, so no one would know about my influential family. I get the bus to school, buy clothes from thrift shops, and prepare my own lunch instead of bringing the gourmet dish the chefs make for me. A perfect normal life. Until Gregory, mom's so-called boyfriend, showed up. He sticks his big nose in everything. Thanks to him, mom wouldn't stop nagging at me about my clothing, my trashy public school, or how I gotta stop hanging out with the mediocre kids. Ugh, he is driving me insane. And to top it off, he gave mom the idea of throwing me a 16th birthday party. I hate attention. Mom knows this. But what Gregory wants, Gregory gets. This could be an opportunity to introduce her to society and gain new associates. It'd be good for her when she takes over business in the future, blah, blah, blah. Poof. Please. The only thing that man cares about is himself and his associates, not mine. In the end, I agreed to a masquerade ball, on one condition. Mom has to stop interfering with who I should or shouldn't hang out with, especially my friends at school. And that brings us to the present. Right when the host announces that it's time for... My first dance? Huh? My what now? Ugh. Gregory! I was confusedly looking around to find a partner, when suddenly a hand grabbed me. Birthday girl, come dance with me. Ugh, what a creep. Let go! Can somebody help me with this? Suddenly a boy around my age appeared. Oh my. He has the most beautiful gray eyes I've ever seen. Excuse me, sir. I believe the lady has agreed to have her first dance with me. Thank you, handsome stranger. As we danced, I couldn't help but stare dreamily into those gorgeous eyes of his. We were about to leave the dance floor when he whispered in my ear, Wait here. I'll be right back. <sighs> Who would have thought a superficial party like this would lead me to my perfect guy? Suddenly... I heard a snapping sound behind me, and as I turned around, my mask fell off. Oh no, a paparazzi cut my mask string. I tried to cover my face with my hands, but it was no use. Luckily, Mum rushed over and hid me behind her. Sorry everyone, but the party's over. We had a great time and hope to see you all again soon. Then she led me back to my room, while the security showed everyone the way out. From that moment on, my ordinary life ended for good. My face was plastered all over the internet as the billionaire Jacqueline Mars' daughter. Now everyone at school is looking at me funny. I don't get it, guys. I'm still the same old Viv. Oh, there my besties are. They would surely have my back, right? But nope. As I approached them, they went ballistic on me, saying how I don't trust them enough to confess about my actual background. So from now on, we're no longer friends. This is so unfair. I never asked for any of this. I wipe away my tears, trying to act like nothing happened. Huh? What's this? There's a note lying on top of my books that says, Hey, it's me, the guy from your birthday party. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. If you need anyone to talk to, text me anytime. Oh, so he's from our school? Wow. Just when I thought no one's there for me, he showed up again. But there's no name, though. Is he still playing this mysterious game? Okay, I'll just call him my mask tonight then. From that day on, we texted non-stop. He just gets me. My family situation, my friends, everything. One time he even secretly slid a Blackpink concert ticket in my bag, since I once told him that I was their diehard fan. Another time, he sent me a gift card to my all-time favorite ice cream store, Ben & Jerry's, just to cheer me up on a bad day. Aww. This ice cream tastes delicious, but I can't help wishing the masked knight was here with me. All I know is he has the most beautiful gray eyes and gorgeous black hair. Hmm. Oh, speak of the devil. Hey, I have a surprise for you this Valentine's Day. Hope you're as excited to see me as I am to see you. Finally, I get to meet the boy I'm crazy about. I can't wait. On Valentine's Day... I was in English staring out of the window and thinking about my masked knight. I wonder what he looks like. Ladies, I brought your valentines, roses. Here you go, Viv. This is it. It's gotta be from him. Happy Valentine's Day. 
Have a taste of the rose, then come meet me at the pool. X. I quickly unwrapped the candy, popped it into my mouth, then rushed to meet my dream man. Well, where was he? As I tried calling him, the room started to spin. I saw the outline of a blurred black figure, then... Ugh. My head is killing me. Where am I? And whose hand am I holding? Hold on. Those eyes. He must be. Thank goodness you're awake. Uh, are you the one who danced with you at your birthday party? In the flesh. I'm Jeremiah, by the way. I had higher hopes for our first face-to-face -face meeting, but oh well. <laughs> Turns out, he always knew I went to the same school as him, but he was a bit intimidated by my family's influence, so he decided to get to know me via text first. He said the cops had found some sort of sleep-inducing substance in my rose candy. Before I could quiz him anymore on this, Mom barged into the room and hugged me. After making sure I was okay, she turned to Jeremiah and said, You saved my daughter. For that, I can never thank you enough. Please join us for dinner tomorrow night. Jeremiah seemed hesitant at first, but then he nodded in agreement. Hmm. The dinner did not go as planned. Between Mom's blatant interrogating and Gregory's menacing looks, I could sense Jeremiah's discomfort. Then when Jeremiah asked where the restroom was, Gregory insisted on showing him. When Jeremiah returned, he seemed flustered and made his excuses to leave. Gah. What had that annoying Gregory said to him? I quickly followed Jeremiah and apologized, but he just smiled and offered to pick me up for school tomorrow. The cops haven't found the culprit yet, so from now on, I'll be your guardian. How sweet. After that, I hung out with him every day. Great, right? Only, somehow it didn't feel the same as when we were texting. Back then we had a deep connection. Now it was just like two friends hanging out. Oh, and not to mention Olivia, Jer's childhood friend who can't seem to leave him alone for more than two seconds. One time, Jer and I were at the movies together, but guess who coincidentally appeared and plonked herself down next to him? Yep, Olivia. Worse still, with their giggling and popcorn sharing, I felt like the third wheel. I was not having this again, so I just left for home in this random cab parked outside the theater. But bad luck. The driver doesn't know the way. He doesn't even have a phone, and I had to lend him mine for GPS. The guy snatched it out of my hand immediately. Rude! But wait, it was 9pm already. Why did he still have shades on? And even wore a mask? Right then, I realized the car had passed the town's border. Stop! The car suddenly filled with smoke, and the last thing I thought was, he has eyes that were exactly like Jairs. I woke up finding myself in this old, cobwebby room. Where is this place? And that driver guy? I have to get out of here now. <clears throat> right at that moment, he came into the room with a smile. Don't you recognize me? Will you have another dance with me? Cause I'd love that. What is happening right now? What he just said? Did that mean he's the actual masked knight? Maybe that's why I don't feel connected to Jeremiah. Why did Jer lie to me then? So many questions popped up in my head. Then suddenly I heard a car stop outside. That guy immediately went to check. This could be my chance of escaping. By the time I got downstairs, I saw the driver guy talking to Jeremiah. So I hid behind the door and watched on. Cameron, just stop this. Getting revenge on our father is one thing, but this is a step too far. Take Viv back to her family now and end this. I know this looks bad, but trust me, I'd never hurt Viv. I didn't mean for her to fall into the pool. That's why I jumped in to save her. But I need her as bait to show the world what that jerk Gregory is like. He doesn't deserve to be her father. <gasps> I muzzled myself in shock. Gregory is their father? And that Cameron guy was the one saving me, not Jer? Don't you forget who abandoned us when Mom had a close brush with death, then took all our business and properties, even our home, leaving us helpless? That jerk deserves all he gets. I was trying to process it all when another car arrived. Gregory's. I quickly hid under the stairs before he walked in with a bunch of bodyguards. 
Cameron, Jeremiah, my sons, haven't you grown up so fast? Cut to the chase, give us back the business and what's rightfully ours, then we'll let your stepdaughter go. Huh, <laughs> indeed, like father like sons, very smart, but still amateurs, my boys. You see, all that girl is to me is an obstacle blocking my way to the inheritance. So please, be my guest and take care of that little Miss Annoying. Aren't you afraid we'll expose everything you just said? And who's gonna believe you now? Jacqueline is mesmerized by me, so she'd believe anything I say. <laughs> that snake. How dare he speak of my mom like that? Unable to hold in my rage, I jumped out of my hiding spot and screamed at Gregory. What did you say about my mom? You slimy, lying traitor! Nice talking to you all, but the fun has to end here. Goodbye. The guards lunged forward, about to tie me up when… The cops smashed the door coming in, and behind them was… Mom! Stop right there! How dare you do this to my daughter! Gregory's face turned paler than a ghost as he mumbled out, Jackie, honey, why you're here? Um, but just in time to save our baby, Vivian. Cut the act. I already heard everything you said. And you're going to jail for a long time. Then the cops led him and took his crook guards away. Seeing Mum, I was so happy I rushed to hug her. Turns out, her investigations of the pool incident led her to Cameron. So when she confronted him, he eventually told her everything. That's how they came up with a plan to catch Gregory red-handed. Mum and the cops had been waiting in ambush around here for Gregory to show up. Then, well, you know the rest. A lot has happened in three months. Mum finally finished all the legal stuff, so now the property Gregory had merged with hers to gain her trust is now signed back over to Cam and Jeremiah. I realized that being wealthy isn't a bad thing, especially as it means with influence like this, I can help other less fortunate people and really make a difference. Now I help mom with her business and her charity work, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm proud of my hard-working, amazing mom, and I'm proud of who I am. And guess what? I now have real friends who like me for me. As for Jeremiah, well, he apologized about everything. He used to fear his brother was gonna hurt me, so he lied to protect me. We made up, of course, and became the best of friends. I'm not sure I can say the same about his brother, though. He did everything he could to beg for my forgiveness, but I just… can't. Then one day, Jer asked me to come by his home to visit his mom. She begged me not to think badly of her boys, especially Cameron. He's in love with you, you know? He always talks about you, and how he wishes things would have been different. Oh boy, her words are starting to have an effect on me. When I walked out the door, I saw Cameron sitting on the porch. He turned and looked at me, and I felt my heart pound for my grey-eyed, masked night. So, taking a deep breath, I walked over to him, just as the sun was setting. This school is so boring. All they do is talk nonsense and do nonsense things. Worse still, I feel like I can never escape them, as some of them live in the same neighborhood as me. But you know what the most annoying thing about my life is? That's Joy, my identical twin sister. In my parents' eyes, she's perfect. That's why she's the favorite child. Her allowance is more than mine and she gets to attend an elite private school while I'm stuck at the most boring school ever. How unfair! With a sulky face, I walked into my room whining. I think having identical daughters means our parents forgot that there's actually two of us. They've never picked me up from school. Don't be absurd, they just took me to collect my dress for the school gala. <laughs> a new dress for some fancy party. How terrible for you! I don't even want to go to the party. Trust a nerd like you not to appreciate what you have. If I were you, I'd make the most of every second of that elite school of yours. And if I were you, I would just enjoy my pressure-free life. We both <sighs> sighed and stared into a void thinking about our tiring lives. Then Joy suddenly turned to me. Oh my god, Jade! Do you want to be me? Go to my school, have my things, and attend the gala? What a brilliant idea! Why had we never thought of it before? I'd live her fancy life and she'd live my doll one. That's perfect! Wow, this school is enormous. 
I tried to keep my cool as I navigated the endless hallways in search of Joy's locker. Ah, found it. I spotted a group of girls waving me over. They must be Joy's besties, Ruth, Nora, and Nell. Unlike my boring sister, they looked very glam in their branded clothes. What a power group. Wherever we went, all eyes were on us. Students handed us snacks, saved places in the cafeteria line for us, and let us sit in the front row of the basketball match. These girls were so interesting that I fit in with them way more than Joy did. Talking about Joy, she somehow loved my boring old-fashioned school. I'd never heard her chat that much in my life about how nice my friends were, how easy all the lessons were, and how cool the school bus was. Joy's friends were so much fun, and they did cool things. For instance, they always had shopping dates and bought each other expensive gifts without question. One time, Nora, the richest girl in the group, didn't hesitate in going into Kate's spade and buying the new release handbag for Ruth. I thought this was pretty awesome of Nora, but then something happened that made me question the group dynamics. Ruth told me that she liked the red velvet cupcakes at the bakery near my house, and she asked me to buy her some. I was happy to do it, but the next day, when I brought the cupcakes and told her the price, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Joy, my dear, I don't care how much they cost. That's your concern. Then she turned to Nora, showed her a picture of a cute but expensive skirt, and told her to order it for her. Hang on. Had she always been thinking it was acceptable to order us around like this? I don't understand why an innocent bookworm like my sister would hang around with this cunning clique. They don't study at all. During the test, while I was still randomly circling the answer, Ruth kept on kicking my chair and urging me to let her copy my work. And as soon as the teacher turned her back on us, she even snatched my answer sheet. Huh? What's with that attitude? I took a look around and saw both Nora and Nell were also copying another girl's paper against her will. Rude! After the test, Ruth came up to me, hissing. Have you forgotten our deal? Huh? Deal? What could it be? Well, I guess I would have to put up with Ruth for as long as I was Joy, so I could return everything to her in roughly the same condition after the gala. What I really should do now is just to enjoy this elite school life, right? So, I didn't join Ruth and her minions for lunch, but bought food from this super cool vending machine instead. They even had pizza! But, the machine made these weird sounds. Ugh, I think my food was stuck. So I kicked and tapped it. But it still didn't work! <laughs> you dare get into an altercation with the pizza machine? You must be starving. Oh. My. God, this basketball boy was the most handsome guy I'd ever seen in my life. I was too lost in his eyes to realize the dumb machine had finally delivered my lunch. This gorgeous guy then leaned towards me and my heart skipped. Oh Cupid, I wish I was the one he picked up instead of the pizza. Here you go. Right before I could react, someone snatched the tray and pushed me aside to enter between us. Thanks Hayden, wanna share lunch with me? <laughs> Excuse me? How could she steal both pizza and a boy from me? The boy took my pizza from her and said, Thanks, but I'd like to share this with this cute starving girl instead. I'll buy the drinks. Wait, was he asking me? Then yes, 100% yes! Leaving a furious Ruth behind us, we walked to the bench table nearby. So, he's Hayden, the captain of the basketball team. We talked so much about our favorite comic books and even played basketball for a bit before classes. That was my best lunch ever. After school, I was about to leave when Ruth stopped me. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to mingle with Hayden? He's not wealthy. We have high standards about who deserves to be around us. Duh! Huh? She sure seemed to swoon over him earlier, but now that he'd turned her down, she decided he wasn't worthy? This girl's mindset really didn't sit well with me. As soon as I arrived home, I told Joy everything. You should listen to Ruth. Hayden must be bad news. I don't care what Ruth thinks. How come you do? Is it because of this deal you have with her? <sighs> Not your business, but stay away from Hayden. I don't want to get in trouble. Ugh, this vague hints were agitating me. What was it about? But whatever the deal between Joy and Ruth was, I wasn't going to let it get in the way of my blossoming romance with Hayden. Today, me and Hayden had arranged to meet at lunch again to play basketball. 
I excitedly walked out of art class just as the girl fell and dropped her painting set around my feet. I immediately picked them up for her, when all of a sudden, a boy's hand covered mine right before someone stamped their feet on our hands. It was Ruth! It was her who tripped up the poor girl too. She did all that on purpose to hurt me, but Hayden got there just in time to save the day. What do you think you're doing? Feeling too embarrassed being caught red-handed, Ruth couldn't do anything but give me a spiteful look before leaving. I couldn't believe that Hayden did that for me. His hand was swollen but he just kept checking if my hand was okay. How can Ruth be so horrible? Because she knows everyone's ugly secrets and she uses them to control people. Joy, she knows your secret too, right? No, uh, um, I'm not sure, but I don't care. No matter what that secret is, she's gone too far. Don't worry, I got your back. So will I. Oh, I'm Katie, by the way. From then on, I no longer hung out with Ruth and her minions, but I kept quiet about this to Joy as I didn't want her freaking out and making us switch back places early. The more time I spent with Hayden, the more I found myself liking him. I wanted to confess to him who I really am, but I can't. At least not yet anyway. <sighs> Katie is really nice to me too, and she introduced me to her super sweet friends. Everything was just perfect, except my grades. Well, I didn't dare to tell Joy about this either. My study was pretty bad, and it literally ruined Joy's straight-A record. Meanwhile, Ruth, time after time, insisted that I was the one who had to do all her homework, research, and tests. But, duh, I couldn't even finish mine. You know what I've got. Yeah? What exactly is that you have? What's all the threat about? Ruth was stunned seeing me talking back at her like that. Yep, that was it. I've had enough. After class, she waited at my locker and signaled me to follow her to the equipment room. Finally, I could know what my secret was. Ruth showed me a video on her phone of Joy sneakily checking her notes during an examination. Was she cheating? If our principal sees this, I'm sure your precious scholarship will be long gone. And what about that excellent student title of yours? So Ruth was using this to manipulate Joy. Does she do the same to everyone else? Do you think this would scare me? I don't think. I know. You don't want to lose everything, right? <laughs> no, Ruth, it's you who's gonna lose. Do whatever you want with that clip, like I care. And so, I walked away leaving a fuming Ruth behind. To be honest, I was a bit scared. Well, I know scores and things like academic transcripts were so important to Joy. What if I destroyed it all? After my last class of the day, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. The principal called me to her office and showed me the video that proved that I cheated on a math exam. She was so disappointed in my horrible grades recently, she even asked if it was because I was too caught up in my dating life and the bad influence I called friends. But how am I supposed to tell her that it was just my own incompetence? Nothing to do with Joy or Hayden or my new friends. I just reached my room door when I heard mom scolding Joy. The principal must have called her. It was all my fault. When mom left the room, I could feel how angry and frustrated mom was. Joy, I'm so sorry. I couldn't let Ruth have this hold over me. Um, I mean you anymore. I waited for Joy to take it out on me, but to my surprise, she was kinda happy. That's okay. I think I should thank you for that. I've never been brave enough to stand up for myself, although I was so tired of getting picked on all the time. I was so scared, but turns out being scolded by mom isn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> My homeroom teacher also called me, but she only gave me a warning and told me not to make the same mistake again. I've never felt this at ease before, Jade. I'm not the perfect Joy anymore. Then, Joy told me about the pressure she felt to be perfect. One time, she even got sick before the math test due to studying too much. Not having enough decent revision and being afraid of getting a bad grade, Joy cheated and was caught and recorded by Ruth as evidence. We finally understood each other and decided to teach Ruth a lesson to stop manipulating and taking advantage of others. We spied on Ruth and secretly recorded her. And guess what? Turned out she was not as wealthy as she always pretended to be. All the brand names she had were from the poor victims that she called friends. I also filmed Ruth forcing the top students to do homework and essays for the rich kids while she just sat idly to collect money. 
I was so ready to post these videos online, but Joy stopped me. She told me if we did this, we were just as bad as Ruth. Instead, she had a better idea. She sent the videos to Ruth and demanded her to delete all of the students' secrets. In exchange, we would delete all of hers. Ruth, of course, had no choice but to obey. Wow, how mature my sister is. My last day in Joy's life has arrived. I'm just gonna make the most of it before I hand the reins back to my sister. Honestly, I kinda miss my normal school and my friends. But what about Hayden? Will he still want to know me when he finds out I lied to him? I was looking around for Hayden when I saw some mean girls mocking Ruth for wearing a dress cheaper than theirs. So I walked straight up to them and whispered into their ears that I knew all their dirty secrets and they couldn't do anything else but storm off. Ruth gave me a coy look, mumbled a thank you, and then left. At that moment, a warm hand gently clasped mine. Hayden! Wow, you're so cool. I... I'm not that cool, Hayden. Actually, I am... Um, I have something I have to tell you. I then told him everything, from how I swapped identities with my twin sister to how I ruined her school life because of my childishness. You didn't ruin anything. Actually, you made things much better. So, since the pizza vending machine day till now, it has always been you, not Joy, right? Yeah, it's been me all along. <laughs> That's all I needed to know. Then he pulled me in for the best kiss ever. Eh, <sighs> it's been a long time since I was able to enjoy myself at a party. It sure felt good. Now just one thing left to make this night even more perfect. I'm going to make my crush mine. There he is, Jad. O-M-G. Did he just glance at me? I could feel my heart flutter. As I immersed myself in a world with only Jad and me, the face of Harry the Metal Mouth suddenly popped up from nowhere. It's time for bed, mommy's little princess. What on earth was he saying? And why was everyone running toward the window like that? I jostled into the crowd and I peeked down. Oh, for heaven's sake! The beyond cringy woman standing there holding the speakerphone was none other than my mom! Janice, it's 10 p.m. You know it's your turn to stay with me tonight. I won't be able to sleep without you. God, is there any way for me to just evaporate right here, right now? This is too embarrassing. But wait, how did she know I was here? I immediately looked over at Christine. It must be her again. Everyone knew she had a huge crush on Jad too, and would do anything to get him. She's definitely the snitch. <sighs> it's so frustrating. Anyway, let me fill you in on the situation. This crazy woman is my mom, who gave birth to not only me, but also my older sister Patty and my big brother Will. I guess we all turned out alright, but this wasn't down to mom. She didn't raise us, our nanny Randy did. You see, mom used to be an actress. She was always busy, busy, busy with her work and her numerous flings. Which resulted in each of us three having a different father. Luckily, we had Randy to take care of us, so I never felt like I was missing out on anything. On the contrary, having to see mom all day is a problem for me. A month ago, mom suddenly decided to retire and move in with me and my siblings. And who knew that an out-of-date star could be such a childish, clingy nightmare? Ugh! She didn't like being alone, so she insisted Patty and I had to take turns sleeping next to her. Then, she forced us to accompany her to the mall and be her luggage gophers and talk to her while she went for the zillionth beauty treatment of the week. One day after an exhausting day out with mom, we entered the house to Will rushing over and shouting. Mom, why did you tamper with my laptop? It turned out that Will had applied to the Juilliard Institute, one of the most famous art institutes in New York. But mom went on his laptop and deleted the school's acceptance email, meaning poor Will had missed out on the response deadline. Oh, sweetheart, I didn't mean to. I was trying to send an email to report those scammers on TV. But I must have accidentally deleted your email. That's probably a good thing anyway, son. It would be better to apply for an economics major at the State University. So our family won't have to be apart. Do you know how hard it was to get in there? Ugh, I can't do this right now. I'm done. Dinner with mom tonight was super awkward. It was just me and her, as Will was simmering in his room, and Patty… well, I don't know where she was. Afterward, I passed by her room and overheard a whimpering sound. I peeked through the gap in the door and saw Will also trying to calm Patty. 
James is now insisting on breaking up with me. If mom hadn't come to my company and bragged that her daughter was the manager's girlfriend, the story wouldn't have reached my boss and neither of us would be in this mess. I know, right? Mom never cared about us before, but now she thinks she can just waltz back into our lives and do whatever she wants? I've had enough of this. We're both over 18 now. Let's just move out. Oh, no, 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 no. No! Look at their determined eyes. I couldn't let this happen. What about me? Please don't go. I'm not 18 yet. Don't leave me alone with mom. I beg you. Both of them gasped when they saw me. Then after a moment of silence, Will spoke up. Okay, we won't go. But at least we need to get things back to normal. I mean, back to just the three of us and Nanny Randy living in this house. And so, Will suggested we pull a bunch of pranks that would annoy mom so much she'd end up leaving. But they were all busy with their studies and work, so they left it to me to carry out the pranks. Okay then, I'm ready. You can see how my mom was addicted to cola from the pile of empty cans over there. She often did midnight dashes to the convenience store when she ran out. So, my first plan was to make all the cola she's just bought disappear time after time. <laughs> Frustrated much? However, she was strangely calm and acted like it's no big deal at all, and even bought a drinking helmet to make sure her coke was always with her. Attempt failed. Move on to the second plan. Hide the Nintendo Switch. Why, you ask? Every night, mom made us play on that thing with her, and honestly speaking, she was the worst player ever, but she wouldn't accept it, and kept making us play those boring games with her until she won. Now, no Switch, no troubles, right? Wrong! As having nothing to do, she came up with much more dumb things to ask us to do with her. From teaching her to cook, gardening, and even doing yoga with her. Having mom around is like caring for a toddler. She needs constant care and attention. It's tiring. I can't bear it anymore. You clearly didn't carry out the tricks properly. You're making the situation even worse, don't you see? <sighs> Looks like we'll have to get the job done ourselves. Oh yeah? Fine. You guys do better then. And so they carried on by using mom's ultimate fear of spiders. She's terrified of them. Even the teeny tiny ones were enough to cause her to climb onto a chair in fright until one of us removed it. So, Patty asked me to buy fake spiders online. Then she hid them all over our house. But this time, without panicking, she even picked it up and tossed it in our direction, which freaked us out instead. So, Will decided it was his turn to take some action. He planned that one evening, I would distract Randy, and in the meantime, Will would throw a feast at home then swiftly drag all his friends out, leaving a huge mess for mom. Despite never lifting a finger on cleaning, mom is actually a clean person, so it would definitely drive her crazy. But nope, once again, it didn't go as planned when Will and Patty came home to find Randy there, helping mom clean up the whole mess. Of course, I was the one who got the blame, again. Janice, you told us you were able to get Randy away from the house for a day, didn't you? I... I did ask her to take me to Dad's, but like midway there, she realized she forgot her phone and insisted on going back. Oh, stop with all the excuses. You're so useless and always do things by halves. The spider trick must have also failed because you bought some cheap ones that look too obviously fake. Yeah, perhaps you've been bought off by Mom, aren't you? Spill it! Ugh, are they seriously accusing me of betrayal right now? Enough! If you're that good, then do it all yourself! I stormed off without any extra words to them. The next morning, while watching Netflix, I heard Patty and Will arguing. It turned out Patty let her boyfriend use her car and he forgot to come pick her up to work. So she's trying to borrow Will's bike so she wouldn't be late for a meeting. But Will wouldn't let her because he had an important dance workshop to attend. Don't your dumb class just always repeat the same wriggle moves? Take the bus instead. You won't die if you're a little late. It's not my fault your gold digging boyfriend forgot to pick you up in your own freaking car. You should have broken up with a jerk like him ages ago. They continued quarreling for a while until I saw Will launch his way down from upstairs shouting. Fine, just take it. Has anyone ever been able to stop you from anything, bossy patty? And he headed straight outside to his bike, then came back after a bit, probably to get some air to calm down. Ugh, would these two give it a rest? How were we meant to figure out a way to win against mom when they couldn't even go a day without bickering? Right then, mom walked in and told me she was going to bake the cake Patty had shown her how to do yesterday. 
Oops, but I forgot to buy eggs. I wonder if Will needs to use the bike today. I'll borrow it just for a bit. Ha! Great! If mom took the bike, then both of my annoying siblings would have to stop squabbling about it. Right? Yes, mom. Take it. Will said he was gonna take the bus today. It'll be faster to cycle to the grocery store anyway. Then mom hopped on the bike and shakily rode off. After a while, Will and Patty went out to the yard and of course, the bike was no longer there. After I told them that mom had already taken the bike, Will stopped dead. Because the truth was that he had purposely broken the brake so that Patty wouldn't take it. Patty tried calling mom but she didn't pick up. Then came a call from Randy. She told us that mom had crashed the bike and had been hospitalized. Oh no. We rushed there immediately. Unfortunately, apart from a ligament sprain, she's fine. It could have been much worse. But that meant she had to wear a bandage for a whole month to stabilize her leg. Ugh, this was all our fault. So now we had no choice but to whimper to mom's every demand. Mom insisted I spoon feed her all of her meals. When I mentioned that there was nothing wrong with her hands, she told me that the trauma to her leg had affected her entire body. She made Patty light loads of candles, play soothing melodies, and rearrange her bedroom furniture so she had a relaxing space to heal. And she got Will to download her old movies for her and feed her popcorn while she watched them on repeat. Of course, we were really worried about her and hoped she'd recover as soon as possible, but honestly, her ridiculous demands were going too far. Then, one day, she insisted we go to a picnic, as sitting inside all day was making her depressed. So, we did exactly just that. Then, while we were walking on a slope, I dropped my bag and bent down to pick it up. Oops, I forgot to lock the wheelchair's wheels! I gasped as I saw mom whiz down the hill. But immediately, she hopped out of the chair and landed on her feet perfectly fine. Will and Patty stared in confusion at mom's casket due like performance. What about me? <laughs> nah, I'm not surprised at all, cause I was the one who set this whole thing up to expose mom. Nanny Randy has told me everything. I know she has been helping you dodging our tricks, as well as carrying out that fake bike accident. Please, why do you have to make life so difficult for us? You never even cared about us, did you? As soon as I finished, mom burst into tears, then she began to pour her heart out. As it turned out, after her career finished, all the fortune, glory, friends, colleagues, and even men who once said that they'd love her for the rest of their lives, turned their backs on her. She was extremely lonely and needed us, her children, more than ever. Now I only have three of you. In the past, I didn't fulfill my responsibilities as a mother, and I know I let you all down. But now I realize my mistakes. I only did what I did because I wanted to draw you back close to me. Please forgive me. Give her a chance, kids. Although your mother's actions were somewhat misjudged, she only did them because she genuinely cares about you. Janice, she worried your partying was causing you to neglect your studies. Well, she didn't want your dancing dreams leading to showbiz nightmares like hers. And Patty, trust your mom, she was right this time. Turns out, mom once caught James, the manager, aka Patty's boyfriend, secretly dating the receptionist. <laughs> so she intentionally made a fuzz at Patty's office to deter the third wheel. However, what came after didn't go as she expected and led to such a mess. But now, mission complete! We came here to catch Patty's cheating boyfriend red-handed. Or should I say, her ex-boyfriend. And of course, we made sure he paid for a worthy price for his actions. Ah, <sighs> justice has been served. <laughs> now, to relax. Patty and mom are getting along much better now. They even look more like an endearing couple of sisters than mother and daughter. <laughs> Will's taking mom to one of his contemporary dance shows, so she can see how important it is to him. And me? I may be the youngest in the family, but while Will's away, it's my job to make sure mom has someone to lean on. And I'm glad to take on this role. Maybe having my mom around isn't actually bad after all. It's finally the first day at the aquarium. And to say I'm nervous is an understatement. Stay calm, you can do this. <sighs> You're Ariel, not Naira. I'm headstrong, spirited, and... Okay, let's get into character. Bright smile, check. Friendly manner, check. Ariel's accent, check. I was a dazzling mermaid and even let the little kids stick their stickers on my fishtail while I answered a bazillion questions about Atlantica and my Prince Eric. The last visitor was the sweetest little girl who handed me a collectible box of cutlery as a gift. Oh my, such a lovely comb, but it looks rare. Are you sure your guardians would agree to this? 
Of course. My brother always says yes to me. The little girl signaled someone in the crowd to come over. And it was Arson? As in the cutest boy from school? Naira? Oh my god. Your take on Ariel is spot on. I didn't know there was a side of you. I... What are you talking about? I know not of this Naira. Feeling the panic rise in me, I lifted my fishto costume and ran with my two feet as all the kids stared in shock. I would never wanted to disappoint those kids, but I had the biggest crush on Arson, and no way had I expected him to be there and see me like this. <sighs> At school, I was a loser, a nobody. Yet, when I was acting, I felt invincible. At least, I did until my timid, introverted side got in the way of my performing dreams. That day, our drama club mentor announced our school play this year would be Legally Blonde. I loved that movie so much, and I already knew all the lines. I couldn't let this opportunity pass me by, so when the mentor asked who wanted to audition as the lead, Elle Woods, I took all the courage and raised my hand. The whole room fell silent, and suddenly burst into laughter. Oh please, how could a loser like you play the glamorous Elle Woods? Worst of all, the mentor agreed with her and said that I might be better suited for the nail lady role. And then she said the lead should go to someone who's outgoing and influential, like Eliza. What? Eliza's got the emotional range of a teaspoon. I gotta get this role. So I waited until the end of the meeting and then spoke to the mentor in private. I'm sorry, but I can't cast an Elle Woods with stage fright. Naira, I'll consider giving you the role, but only if you can prove to me that you can do this without your fear getting the better of you. So, try practicing by going out in public and interacting with strangers. Get yourself comfortable in front of a crowd. Can you do that? Feeling determined, I went to look for some kind of social experiment right away. And that's why I applied for this job at the aquarium. But I never thought anyone from class would show up. Least of all, Arson. He even caught up with me at school the next day, insisting he saw me at the aquarium. And typical me, being all fidgety and shy, I blurted out, maybe you mistook me for my twin sister, Cora. Oh, in that case then, can I get her number? Or can you like, arrange for me to go on a date with her? The way she glowed with confidence was amazing. Well, I didn't expect him to be that into my acting. How ironic. Wait, what if I continue to play Cora and go on a date with him? I could practice my acting as this unapologetically outgoing girl while spending time with him? Tempting, right? Okay, wait at the book cafe near school on Sunday, 3 p.m. I'll tell Cora about it. I'd been preparing for this date the whole week. After watching multiple tutorials on YouTube, I was finally able to put together this bold look. All that's left to do was to wear Cora's self-confidence to match it. So I did a Bella Hadid runway strut into the cafe, straight past the gawping onlookers and over to Arson's seat and interrupted him from his reading. Hi, is that a Rick Riordan's book? Uh, yeah, Heroes of Olympus. Are you a fan of Riordan too? Are you kidding me? I've read all of his works. Yes, Breaking the Ice, success. We connected over our shared love of fantasy novels and other nerdy things. I didn't want the date to ever end, so I invited him along to a secret place of mine. I covered his eyes until we got there. Being the cute guy he was, he went along with it, even though he looked unsure about what was happening. When I turned the lights on and the ice rink appeared, his face lit up. Then the snow began to fall. It felt like a scene out of Frozen. Then we went onto the ice and... Arson fell straight onto his butt. <laughs> Stop laughing, this is my first time, okay? Aww, embarrassed Arson was so cute. <laughs> I helped him up and it was the first time our hands touched. I led him around the rink and taught him some moves. When I looked at him, I saw him looking back at me with this big grin on his face. Then suddenly he pulled me in, and I fell right into his embrace. Our faces were so close, and I swore we were about to kiss. Ugh! Overcome with nerves, I pushed him away, and he lost his balance and fell flat on the ice. But he jumped up to his feet right away and skated after me. Oh, don't let me catch you, or else... Let's see you try. <laughs> Yesterday felt like a dream. We texted each other non-stop up until the last class of the day, P.E. My eyes were still glued to my phone when a flying ball hit my knee. It was from Eliza. Right after that, another one came and knocked my glasses off. I shielded myself with my arms and hoped it would go away soon, and surprisingly, it did. Only, Arson was standing in front of me, blocking all the balls. Arson, what are you doing there? We were just 
playing around. <laughs> playing around? Can't you see you're hurting her? Then Arson turned to me and asked me if I was okay. Could this be it? Did he realize I was the girl he went on a date with? Uh, thank you for helping me out. You're my friend, and also Cora's sister, so I've got to look out for you, right? Oh, he didn't recognize me. That meant my acting was flawless, right? Then why did I feel so uneasy about it? As uncomfortable as I felt about the situation, I also liked Arson way too much to stop it. So I continued pretending to be Cora. He acted so lovey-dovey on our dates, and it made my heart melt. But at school, he only saw me as Cora's helpless, clumsy sister. He talked about her constantly, and stared blankly into space as if there were an imaginary Cora there. It started bugging me that Arson only liked the confident, fun, and spontaneous heroine I'd created. Not coy Naira. <sighs> I couldn't blame him though. If I didn't find myself lovable, maybe that's why mom left me and didn't bother to write or to call. I couldn't do this anymore. I couldn't feed Arson with false expectations of an unreal character. So I typed out a text to Arson telling him that Cora was on her way to study abroad for three years and that this relationship wouldn't work. Arson kept texting back, non-stop, and even came to my house to look for Cora and broke down in tears when I told him she'd already left. I felt so bad, but that was the only way for him to stop fantasizing about Cora. Over time, his pain would fade, right? From that day on, Arson always looked for me at school and consistently asked about her. This didn't go unnoticed by Eliza, who was clearly green with envy. Lunchtime came, and Eliza, along with her minions, suddenly approached me. Why so lonely? Has Arson abandoned you? <laughs> I tried to ignore her and eat my lunch, but she wouldn't leave me alone. Fine then, I'll lend you a hand. Arson, hi! Did you know that Naira here is so obsessed with you? She even admits that she loves to follow you everywhere like a stalker. How creepy. Huh? What was this girl saying? Now people were staring at me, judging me for something that wasn't even true. I was done with being Naira, the loser. If only, yeah, if only Cora's personality helped me stand up for myself. Shut up. Me and Arson are friends, so what? Why do you have to make stuff up about me? Is it because you're jealous of me? Oh, what? Me? Jealous of you? You like Arson, don't you? I feel sorry for you, really. You're gonna pick on everyone he talks to? How pathetic. Just like that, people made disapproving comments at Eliza. She couldn't do anything other than run away in shame. While I suddenly received praise for standing up against the school's tyrant, people seemed to love this new side of me. So perhaps it was a good time to give myself a makeover. The next day at school, I started dressing up boldly and wearing contact lenses instead of nerdy glasses. My classmates seemed to like my new look. My drama club mentor changed her attitude towards me as well. I even applied for the student council and my popularity grew, and so did my friendship circle. The world opened up to me, but weirdly, being around people all the time just felt uncomfortable and exhausting. I couldn't really talk to any of them, as we weren't even close. I just felt so left out. When it came to a charity date auction, being on the council committee meant that I was appointed a bachelorette. That meant everyone joining this event would bid to take me on a date, and that bidding money would go to the school's fund to build a new cafeteria. That's how I ended up here, on stage at the auction. I tried my best to act cool to raise as much money as possible. The boys kept cheering for me, trying to show their charms, and I tried to flirt back by talking nonsense and winking at them. Once the bidding started, chaos commenced as people kept raising their paddle numbers. 40, 60, 80, it suddenly came to me that I didn't want to go on dates with any of these guys. I didn't know them at all. And just then, Arson shouted from the back. 500. 500 going once, going twice, and sold. Arson jumped on stage, grabbed my hand, and dragged me out of there. He led me to the garden, and then he started asking me tons of questions. What is it with you lately? It's as if you're someone else. N no way. I'm just the same old Naira. Tell me the truth. Are you... Cora? You switch places with your sister to protect her, right? Oh, Cora, I've missed you so much. After all this time, he was still in love with Cora? Even now when I changed myself, he still didn't see me as Naira? Arson, I... I can't. And then I just ran out of there. 
After a night of crying myself to sleep, I was back at school and found myself summoned to the principal's office with a smirking Eliza. There she showed the principal a video recording of my conversation with Arson last night, which was proof that someone else had been replacing me at school. If this was true, I could be expelled. Oh no, no, no! Panic! I blurted out a lie that I had bipolar and that sometimes they switched to the other persona and acted up. The principal seemed confused, but then she insisted I go to the school therapist. <sighs> I had no choice but to agree. And it was actually really good for me. Through talking to the therapist, I could finally open up about my past. Ever since I was a kid, I've always been super shy. I thought it was why my mom left me behind when she split from dad and moved out. She hadn't even contacted me once. I know a childish nerd like me would never be the one who she could really talk to. Thank God my dad came to pick me up after that. The thought of facing my so-called friends on the bus was making me nauseous. Were you that unhappy not having your mother around? I just don't know why she left me behind without a word. Was I a loser in her eyes? Honey, listen. Mom loves you. And the reason you didn't receive any letters from her was because I hid them all from you. What? Why would you do that? Because I was so broken after your mom left that I thought it would be better if you and I could forget everything about her. I... I'm sorry. Don't you know how terrible I felt about myself all those years just because of your selfishness? I ran into the house immediately. I couldn't look at him right now, only to see Mom and Cora were sitting in the living room. Both rushed towards me and pulled me in for a hug. Yeah, the Cora character wasn't entirely made up. Instead, I based her on my real life twin sister. The little five-year-old me always struck by Cora's side hid behind her dress while she boldly stood up against anyone who dared to pick on me. I'd always looked up to her. Turned out, when Dad got the call from school, he realized his actions had caused me pain. So he did everything in his power to contact Mom and brought her and Cora from LA to here. Mom kept apologizing to me, saying she regretted every minute of leaving me behind. Seeing them all break down in tears like that ached my heart, but it gave me this warm feeling at the same time. After all this time, my family feud was finally resolved. Just at that moment, the doorbell rang. It's Arson! Naira, is that your boyfriend? What? I dragged him away immediately, and this time I admitted the whole truth to him. I told him how I lied that the girl in the aquarium was Cora, because I didn't think he'd like the real me, as I wasn't a confident presence. But my feelings for him were real, and that's why I tried so hard to get close to him. But I figured now that he knew the truth, it'd be over, so I'd just walk away. Finally, I'm back. I've been in LA for an entire winter break to spend more time with Mom and Cora and to figure myself out. I realized that being an introvert is nothing to be self-conscious about. I'm observant, and that'll help a lot of my acting passion, right? This semester, I'll definitely try to impress my drama club mentor. No boys will ever distract me again. And that's when I spotted Arson waving at me with a huge bouquet in his hand. Arson, what are you doing here? I thought you were still mad at me. Well, I thought about it a lot, and honestly, things between us got messy, so I'd like to get to know you again. Only this time, please can it be the real you, as I really want to know what Naira's about. What do you say? Um, yeah, I'd love that. Hi guys, I'm Mia, a princess from, uh, of course, not the kingdom of far, far away, but a never relatively small country in Europe, which must not be named. That was a Harry Potter reference, in case you didn't notice. Anyway, before I tell you my amazing story, like and subscribe, please? Nah, that's an order. Your Royal Highness, please come down here. In your dreams. Guys, just admit it. You've also dreamed of being able to fly far away with lots of balloons. At least once, right? I'm living your dream right now. But just as I was enjoying the fresh air, actually, the air was kind of thin up here. Anyway, out of nowhere, a flock of birds from the opposite direction flew straight into the balloons. One, then two, then three popped. Catch the princess. No, 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 no. I cannot die like this. Ah! So, at my funeral. Just kidding. Did you seriously think I died? I didn't. But instead, I was immediately taken to the palace in front of the king and mom, who wasn't very happy with what I just did. How could you do something reckless like that? Did you forget who you are? Your majesty, please reprimand her properly so she would not repeat this sort of behavior. <clears throat> That's right. How could you be so careless? 
Next time, prepare more balloons, or at least let me join you. Your Majesty! <laughs> you all know who sides with who now. Growing up, Dad would let me join him in his hunting adventures, but we actually never hunted anything. <laughs> Instead, we would explore the beautiful sceneries together and learn interesting survival tricks. Those hunting trips called the deepest passion for adventures inside me. But of course, Mom only wanted to keep me inside the palace. It's too dangerous. Mia, remember who you are. Or, watch your manners. But I couldn't care less about her because Dad always got my back. <laughs> But everything changed when I was 15. Dad suddenly had a stroke, then fell into a coma. Mom ascended the throne, and my life officially became hell on earth. I'm not even blowing it up. I was not allowed to laugh out loud, eat too much, or even leave the palace anymore. She was so paranoid that she even insisted I have a bodyguard. One day, I was reading a book when the sleepy monster came to visit me. So I asked my bodyguard to play my favorite game with me. Let's take turns naming words starting with the letter B. Whoever loses will have to do a handstand walk around the palace. I'll go first. Bite. After a few rounds back and forth, we started running out of words starting with B. I, I have a word, but I can't say it. Oh, come on. Say it or I'll have you fired. B -b 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 but Right then, Mom came in out of nowhere and immediately fired him just because of using improper language. What choice do I have, really? I tried to negotiate with Mom to let it slide, but she was impossible. So I had another bodyguard, who just moved here from the North Pole. Negotiation wasn't even in his dictionary. One time, I wanted to try this Peter Parker battery experiment, but knowing my bodyguard would never allow it, I asked him to go buy me a chocolate shake. So here I am, ready to become the next Spider-Man. Warning, do not try this at home. Yeah, I'm talking to you all. So anyway, the experiment was quite successful, but my new bodyguard was also fired shortly after. He didn't even know I was doing this. It was my fault this time, Mom. Mom! Then, after a short while of many other recruitments and reconsiderations, the queen finally found another bodyguard who, according to her, <clears throat> had given up her noble position in the royal family to train in the army. You will learn a lot from her, yada yada yada. Does her name happen to be Mulan too? But the moment I met my new bodyguard, I thought she was Miss Universe in disguise. Skin as white as snow, lips red as the rose, and hair black as ebony. Hmm? She looked as fragile as Snow White. How was she meant to protect me? I guess I have to test her then. Come at me already. Before I could process, she rushed towards me faster than the speed of light, and I instantly found myself locked in. Your Royal Highness, I'm Grace. I'll be your bodyguard from now on. G got it. Now could you release me? I was finally freed from her grip. So, Lady Grace, is it true you gave up your title to train in the army? That is true, Your Royal Highness. Just call me Mia. Anyway, why did you do that? I just wanted to follow my martial arts dreams without any restrictions. Grace and I talked some more, and I found out she was actually very pleasant to be with. Over time, Grace and I became closer. She was excellent at her job, protecting me from any trouble I caused for myself. But whenever she could, she would also try to bring me along with her on palace duties. She knew how much I loved to be outside the palace. Everything was better with Grace, until one day after I turned 17, the Queen summoned me in to announce a life-altering news. According to the Royal Covenant, as soon as a princess turns 17, her engagement ceremony is to be held. What? Engagement? There's no way I'll get married at the age of 17 or 18. And should I at least know the name of the unlucky guy? Right then, a guy stepped in. Nice meeting you again, princess. Liam, the duke from a neighboring country? I met him before through some royal parties. Oh gosh, he smelled like he just soaked himself in 1,001 bottles of Dior Sauvage. I mean, look at the way he stroked his hair or applied chapstick. My stomach was literally on strike seeing all of this. Ugh! No, I will not marry anyone. If you guys insist, I... I'll go on a hunger strike! Only, I didn't know hunger strikes require a great deal of mental strength, which I don't have. After skipping lunch, I almost passed out already. Luckily, Grace sneaked in some food for me. Thank you, thank you. There's no way I'm going to skip my 2pm chocolate shake either. I understand what you mean, your highness. It's all because of that stupid Liam guy. Did you see how he acted? He looked like a donkey. Actually, I used to attend some royal classes with the Duke before I gave up royalty. Oh yeah? I bet he failed all the classes. There was no grace in that man. No, he was actually very smart. And he cares a lot about others. You know, a lot of girls in the classes were dying to get with him. So maybe you should just give him some time, your highness. All right, as long as you get me my chocolate shake. It seemed like the hunger strike really worked, since the next day the queen came into my room looking all worried. Mia, have you seriously not been eating? He, yes. Mom, I can't, I can't get ma married. 
Right then, Marcus, Mom's private secretary, came in, interrupting my marvelous acting. Your Majesty, please consider joining the charity program in the Southern Village. I said I will not go. But I'm afraid, since the king became unconscious, the royal reputation hasn't been as good as it used to be. Having a member of the royal family there would help. Ooh, a charity program in the Southern Village? This screams my ticket to freedom. If I go, I could at least delay the stupid marriage. Plus, I'll get to explore the village. Your Majesty, perhaps you could allow me to join the charity program on behalf of the royal family? That is too risky. Actually, having the princess there would also help promote her image as well, given that she is the next in line to the throne. But, Mom, <coughs> this is the only way to lift my gloomy, dying spirits. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mom. This is what a high IQ will get you in life. It seemed like the engagement ceremony with Liam would have to wait, because I, the princess, am setting off to save the world. <laughs> but man proposes, God disposes. When I arrived there, everything was really programmed. Everyone was dressed up, holding flower bouquets, and standing on both sides of the road welcoming me. As soon as they saw me, they all started applauding. I haven't even done anything praiseworthy. Oh wait, should I smile or should I grin? How many teeth should be revealed? Oops, I forgot to check myself in the mirror this morning. Is there any lipstick or veggie stuck on my teeth from breakfast? Suddenly, I noticed a boy with a bouquet of deep red roses looking at me curiously. Are those for me? Thank you very much. No? <laughs> I guess they're for your mom then. I patted him on the head, stopped to all these behind-the-scenes bloopers. As I continued walking, I saw a well-groomed gentleman wearing a hat in front of me. Did the locals here even prepare a moonwalk performance to welcome me? That's so thoughtful! But as I was about to approach, he reached out to stop me and lifted his hat, revealing a cheesy smile. Wait a second. I think I had seen that smile somewhere else before. Bonjour, Nio Principessa. Here we meet again. L Liam? Why are you here? I don't know if you've heard it before, but there's a Chinese proverb that says, If it be fated, even a thousand miles cannot keep us apart. Ugh, I've come all the way here and still can't seem to escape this guy. I'm sure Mom was behind this. <laughs> so you must also know the other saying in Chinese, But if it not be fated, we shall not encounter each other, even if we are face to face. Even after I literally spelled out, I do not wish to see your face like that, he still didn't bat an eye and continued acting cheesy. He even messed around with Grace, too, making her all embarrassed. I had to save her out of there. Just ignore him. I thought upon coming here, I would be free to wander around to explore the surroundings and meet up with new people, but... Without the Queen's approval, your highness is not allowed to go out. Then for food, we were served with all different kinds of exquisite cuisines. So, are we doing charity or on a vacation? Yeah, right. How can the two of us finish all this food by ourselves? You should join us too. That's right. Everyone come join us. W we can't, your highness. Okay, either you all sit down or I'll have you fired. That's the power of being a princess. So, turned out life here was no different from back at the palace. I had to participate in loads of charity duties that didn't have anything to do with charity at all. Worse still, I couldn't even enjoy my snooze privilege anymore. Rise and shine, princess. Today's schedule begins with breakfast at 7 a.m., accompanied by the Duke, followed by an interview with reporters at 8 a.m. At 10.30, your highness and the Duke will deliver gifts to residents of the lodge and take photos with the president and first lady of France. Then at 11.30... All right, all right, at least let me go squeeze the cheese first. No, princess, we don't have any cheese for today's breakfast. If I'm not mistaken, the breakfast menu includes... No, Grace, I mean, I gotta go bake a loaf, uh, plant some corn, uh, I need to go to the bathroom ASAP. Well, breakfast was ruined because of Liam. If it wasn't for Grace, I would have jumped over and torn him apart already. But now, I still have to endure this terrible human being's company for the interview. Let's take a beautiful photo of the princess and the duke together. I angrily looked into the camera while Liam grinned stupidly. Ugh, you guys just want nice pictures of me and Liam? I immediately posed in 101 different positions. Everyone's face went from surprised to confused to speechless. P princess my short-lived spotlight was suddenly taken when Liam also started crawling on the ground and posing like a Zara model. Hey, what are you waiting for? Take as many photos as you want. D did he really go that far? After a whole day of taking photos and interviews and being pretty and breathing, I was exhausted. But I still need to attend this dinner with the president and the first lady of France. I tried to follow along with the conversation, but soon, all the laughter and chatter around me slowly faded away. Then I suddenly saw myself turning into a rabbit running free around the carrot field, hanging out with my turtle friend. As I turned around to look for him, a farmer suddenly appeared and lifted me up. Ah! Turned out the farmer was Grace. <laughs> oh? Did I say something funny? Ahem. 
Right when I was staring daggers at Liam, he suddenly turned serious. Please excuse me. I suffer from a condition called Lavalot from a young age. What's Lavalot? How come I have never heard of it? Oh, only about 0.01% of the population suffers from this, so it's not common. People with Lavalot syndrome have no control over their mouth and jaw muscles, or when to laugh. Oh, I understand. I'm so sorry about that. You're still so young. I tried so hard to hold back my laughter. How could the first lady not figure out Liam was just messing with her? <laughs> It's been a few days, and all I did was eat, sleep, and take pictures. I've had enough. One morning, I called Grayson. The past couple of days have been exhausting, and I've not been feeling well. I'm just going to rest today. Don't let anyone disturb me. I understand, Your Highness. Ah, huh. I should have done this sooner. The front gate was heavily guarded, so I had to sneak out from the backyard. But why was this wall so high? I was about to climb the wall when suddenly I heard a rustling sound below. Huh? A dog hole? Man, I'm in this too deep already. There's no going back. I tried to squeeze through, but I might have had a little too much food for breakfast. Ugh, come on, you got this! Phew! Finally, I took a deep breath. <sighs> so this is what freedom smells like. I followed the road ahead and soon saw a village in the distance. I excitedly skipped towards it, but I suddenly stepped on something that I hope was not man-made. Well, it wasn't man-made, but horse-made! When I was figuring out what to do next, someone passed by. He was tall and handsome, just like a male character walking straight out of a Japanese manga. But why does it have to be in this embarrassing situation? I woke up in shock to find my face covered in bandages. <laughs> my face! This can't be happening! Right, Callum? Tell me this is not happening! <laughs> right after, the doctor entered the room. Miss, unfortunately, the glass from the car window has caused extensive trauma to your skin. As the doctor continued talking, I felt myself zone out and began to panic. My face is everything! Without it, my singing career is over! Ash, it's gonna be okay. I'll help you find a way to return to the stage. I promise. Hi, I'm Ashley, and I had a dream of becoming a famous singer. I used to sing on the streets to collect a few dimes. Then one day, a handsome and polite man approached me. I'm Callum, a talent scout, and I believe with your angelic voice and rare beauty, you have the makings of a star. It was love at first sight, and not only did I gain a manager, but also a hot boyfriend. He arranged for me to perform at cafes, bars, and restaurants. It was nonstop. I enjoyed it, but I have to admit I was also, uh, exhausted. And that's when Callum suggested that I use auto-tune and lip-sync to save my throat. Babe, I know this ain't right, but you're burned out, and I can't bear seeing that. You know, it's not forever. I think that way you can focus on dressing up and letting people admire that gorgeous face of yours. Hearing this did make me feel sad, but Callum knew what he was talking about, so I trusted him. While the fire inside me to perform on a professional stage still burned strong. Then one day, he told me some unexpected good news. No more small gigs. The famous company Dream M Entertainment is holding auditions to find their next big star. I've taken care of everything. You just need to be 100% confident in performing. This was it. My time to shine has finally come. But then that evening, while driving home and practicing singing, I had an uncontrollable coughing fit. I lost focus of the road for a split second and didn't see the incoming car until everything went dark. And the next thing I knew, I was waking up at the hospital looking like Frankenstein and certain that my big dreams were now in shatters. After two months in the hospital, most of my scratches healed, but only a deep cut scar remained on my cheek. Just a few days more until the audition, and I couldn't show up looking like this. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Can makeup cover it? Or maybe a mask? There must be something. But the doctor said I can't wear makeup until it's fully healed, as it might cause an infection. <laughs> and if I went on stage in a mask, people would certainly raise questions. Then Callum's eyes suddenly darted to the photo on the shelf. Ash, here's your answer. Get your sister to be your double until your wound heals. Y you mean Bridget? That freak? No way! Yeah, I do have a twin sister, but we aren't close, for sure. 
My parents divorced when we were seven, and the courts decided I'd live with dad and Bridget with mom. I had a great life with dad as he bought me any outfit I wanted. But Bridget was a tomboy and didn't care about fashion. The last time I saw her, she was wearing all faded clothes. I guess the whole moody, loner, frown like she's constipated look was her vibe. I tried talking to her at college, but she always snubbed me. And just like that, we ended up being strangers, despite being siblings. And now you say I have to grovel her for help? No! I get that you guys aren't close, but surely you can put your differences aside for this once-in-a-lifetime chance at your dream? <sighs> I suppose Callum has a point. So I agreed. Only it wasn't that simple, as I didn't have Bridget's number and she refused to use social media. You know, to match her cool, unbothered vibe. Ugh. Hang on. I remember her scowling at me behind the counter at the Yo-Yo fast food once. Perhaps she still worked there? I immediately disguised myself and headed there. Oh, there she is. I started hovering around her and explained what had happened, then asked her if she'd be my double for the audition. But she didn't bother to care. Get out the way. I can't perform looking like this. Please, this is everything to me. It's none of my business. I have work to do. See, I can't just give up like this. So I ordered food and sat there and waited for her to change her mind. It was closing time already. I was about to leave when I saw Bridget and her boss quarreling with each other. My gosh, this is why it's never good to hire teenagers. I only hired you because you begged for the job. I I'm sorry, sir. I'll... <gasps> Darn it. Starting today, you will work without pay for three months. No, sir, I need money. You didn't even pay me last month. Hey, what are you doing? Go. You can work elsewhere. Don't be here with a scumbag. What? And you? Get lost before I report you to the cops. What you aiming at? Why do you have to work here anyway? Doesn't mom give you a big enough allowance? Don't pretend like you care. How could a spoiled girl like you ever understand? What do you mean by that? Ugh. Anyway, you need money, right? I can help you. Bridget didn't answer, but I saw through her a Miss Frosty persona. If you replace me until I'm recovered, then I'll pay you. A big check worth ten times what you're making here. By the way, only two of us and my manager know about this, so don't worry. Then I gave her my number and told her to message me when she made a decision. She reluctantly took it, saying nothing and just left. But that evening, a message from an unknown number popped up. Okay, I'm in. You better pay me right. I immediately called Callum and told him the good news. Now it's time to turn Bridget into a temporary me. Normally, Callum and I keep our relationship low-key to maintain professionalism. And that's the same now. We're keeping it a secret with Bridget. Callum made it clear to Bridget that all she needed to do was to look pretty and lip sync. But geez, that girl could only moan. This crop is too tight and constricting. Stop scratching like a monkey. I showed her how to stand straight and walk like a diva. And it shocked me when she said she'd never heard of skincare. No wonder her skin was as dry as the Sahara Desert and her pores were as deep and large as black holes. No worries. The witches here will give you a magic transformation. Wow. She looked exactly like me, just without the wound. <sighs> Even Callum was impressed. He instantly offered to help her into the car and drive her to the audition. Mm, I guess it made sense for Callum to keep her on our side. Now is not the time for stupid jealousy, Ashley. I disguised myself as Bridget's assistant and nervously waited backstage. The audition was such a nightmare. Bridget's lip syncing didn't match the pre-recorded audio, and she danced like she had two left feet. Finally, the performance ended, and the first judge to comment was David Knight, a.k.a. the music wizard, master composer, and lord of melodies. Oh, I know this guy. He's sure a demigod in real life. Your singing was dismal, and your dancing was catastrophic. Did you get lost looking for the bathroom and wander on stage by accident? Having a pretty face isn't enough to keep you here. The judge sitting next to David suddenly grabbed the mic. Wait, he's the CEO of Dream M. <clears throat> Uh, you're wrong, David. Beauty is also talent. She's a diamond in the rough and only needs a little polishing to shine. After the show, Callum was overjoyed as he informed Bridget that she'd become a talent at Dream M and would soon become an A-lister. I was so excited, too, that I flung my arms around Bridget, but she coldly pushed me away. Enough for today. Since then, the three of us agreed that Bridget would perform on stage while I would record at the studio. The bad side was about putting up with David, the difficult judge at the audition who was in charge of my recording session. 
The only thing going for you is your face. So why hide it behind that mask? If you must know, I didn't have time to apply any makeup. Satisfied much? Sorry, what you say? It was too early in the day to deal with such a jerk. So I stayed silent and focused on the session. Hmm, your singing has improved significantly since the audition. It just still lacks some emotion. Haha, <laughs> thanks. My debut was just days away, but things didn't go so well. Bridget had no sense of style and appeared in the fashion column Worst Dress Lists, shaking like a leaf on stage and jumbling her words when facing impromptu interviews. So I had to set up a crash course for Bridget, but this time I taught her simple, easy-to-remember things instead of big stuff like last time. I showed her how to pair basic outfits, how to deal with the press, and most importantly, I still guaranteed her regular pay. Ash, you, um... You've helped me a lot, and I... Anyway, so... Thanks. Oh my, she was so awkward. But that was sweet. I could gradually feel that we were actually sisters. Bridget, the main effort was still yours. Keep it up. Soon, the company began to promote Bridget, and her reputation skyrocketed. All the while, my relationship with Callum took a nosedive. At previous events, Callum used to pamper me and bring me my favorite foods. But now, he just brought Bridget's favorites. He never left her side, and they were always having cozy chats. So one day, I decided to talk straight to him about this. Callum, I have to admit that I feel kind of uncomfortable, as you're a bit too close to Bridget. Babe, I got you. I have to pretend I'm with Bridget as everyone thinks she's you. I'm doing this for your own good, so stop overthinking. Will you do it for me? I know, but I really feel insecure since I got this scar. It's like I've lost everything. Don't worry, the scar will eventually heal. The most important thing right now is you stay calm and get through this time. Ah, right. I suddenly forgot that I was working for a greater goal. I tried convincing myself that they were just dedicated to their work and that my wound would be healed soon and I could go back to being me. I still go to the hospital every week for follow-up and treatment. It's faded, hasn't it? I needed to escape, so I went to the studio to sing my heart out. I was certain no one would be there at this time of night, but turned out I was wrong. Surprisingly, on seeing me, that dude didn't shoo me away. Instead, he was actually pleasant. A night owl too, huh? Start singing then. I'll give you my valuable opinions. I was shocked by this approachability, but I rolled with it. David was many things, but there was no denying he was extraordinarily talented that made huge hits. I sang, and he gave me some useful tips and pointers. I believed you'd be too haughty to listen to my guidance, but it turns out I was mistaken. Well, I found you annoying at first, but I appreciate your help and I value your feedback. It seems there's actually a nice guy behind the ogre front. S sorry, what you say? I won't say it twice. Then I started humming a few lines from a song I'd written, but didn't realize I was singing it out loud until it was too late. That song is good. Whose is it? Uh, actually, I wrote it. No need to be mocking. No, I'm not at all. I didn't know you had a talent for songwriting. Come here. Let me hear the whole song. So we sat down together, and surprisingly, our vibe matched each other perfectly. Actually, you're the first person to take my ability seriously. Sorry? Hey, stop pretending! Actually, I'm not pre- Gradually, Bridget seemed to figure out how to act like me, and her popularity grew. She was no longer sluggish and paid more attention to her appearance. Even Callum mentioned how he could only distinguish us by my wound. From then on, Callum said Bridget could do it herself, so they went to the shows without me. This feeling is making me squirm. On the one hand, I want Bridget to do well to help me out. On the other hand, I'm also feeling a bit resentful that I was replaced so easily. I also miss the way Callum used to care about me. But I remember what he said the other day, and I know I shouldn't be acting like a child. So I tried to distract myself by doing what I love the most, singing. Everybody was packed with Bridget's show, so this world is mine. Woohoo! I was in the studio practicing my new song when suddenly David barged in. Can you explain to me why you're here whilst also performing on TV live? W why are you here? Does it even matter now? Who really are you? I begged him to keep quiet. Then I frantically took my mask off and told him everything. I mean, everything. As I was too shocked to make any excuses. This is insane. I 
know it isn't right, but, but I, I promised once my wound healed, everything would go back to normal. Singing is everything to me. David remained silent for a while, then blurted out, All right, if what you said is true, I will keep your secret. And one more thing, if you really like singing and songwriting, I can continue to help you. What do you say? Y yes, yes, totally, yes. And don't you dare lie to me. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. Yeah, swear to God. Finally, it was the follow-up day. As the doctor finished the examination, I saw him frown. I'm sorry to inform you that the scar cuts too deep. It may fade over time, but I'm afraid it won't go completely. At least in two years. I broke down. This couldn't be happening. <laughs> Not knowing what else to do, I decided to go and find Callum. But when I arrived at his house, I saw that he wasn't alone. Bridget and Callum were sitting together and slowly leaning for a kiss. I was chewing popcorn watching my favorite channel with my bestie Diana. When I heard Juliana's screeching voice, Cheryl! Emergency! Help me! I dashed towards her room to see her struggling with clothes. Oh, my dear, you're here. Come and help me choose which bag would suit my gown better. Gucci or Versace? Is this your emergency? Yes, absolute emergency. I must look fab on tonight's date. What? A date? Don't you remember you just cried your eyes out for some jerk yesterday? Can you believe her? <clears throat> Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Cheryl, living in New York. And that's Juliana, my aunt. My parents passed away when I was little. Since then, Juliana moved in and became my guardian, as per their will. She was funny and expected to make good company in this huge house, but most of the time she wasn't around. The only time she sat down with me was... I just bought him a brand new Bentley to walk his dog the other day, but the next day he immediately dumped me! He said he wanted to share my burden, but seeing how heavy my 20 carat diamond necklace is, he stole it and ran away! <laughs> my auntie always left with all her heart, only her taste in men really need some fixing. As you can see, all gold diggers. But for some reason, she refused to see those red flags and still hooked on them like a crazy bull. And inevitably, <sighs> her long list of heartbroken stories keep getting longer and longer. Recently, Juliana met someone new and dined out every day. But you know how it's gonna end. <sighs> Once they steal something from her, they surely would run away and leave her inconsolable back to me. <sighs> Actually, I've once dated a guy like that. But of course, I'm not easy to deceive like Juliana. Once I sensed something fishy about that guy, I kicked him in his butt right away. That's why it's my first and also my only relationship I've been in. But no big deal. I have my bestie Diana. She might look timid, but really reliable. She knew everything about me. <laughs> then one day, Juliana asked me to join them for dinner. Wasn't this the first time she introduced her boyfriend to me? But this guy was kind of special or even strange to her usual style. Hmm. Juliana only ever dated six-pack guys. But now, what's this overweight, short, and bald man doing here? Auntie, are you all right? But the real bummer was he brought along his son, who also happened to be Andrew, my freaking gold digger ex. It all happened when I was 14, the age where everyone was in a relationship, <coughs> except me and Diana. One day, my class gathered to play kiss, spin the bottle, and on my turn, the bottle pointed to Andrew, the only boy in my class who was single at that time. Friends screamed in extreme excitement and started to push us together, and we kissed. Since then, my classmates started to ship us as a couple, until one time Andrew came to me. Hey, you don't have a boyfriend. I don't have a girlfriend. Why don't we become an item? Our friends seem to like it too. Stupid offer, right? But 14-year-old me thought it's a good idea to join the dating circle like my friends after all. I mean, being the only single girl really sucked. And he surely got a look and would make a good match with me. So I agreed. And we became official and did what other couples do from holding hands to public kissing. Andrew turned out to be a good acting partner. And it was quite fun, to be honest. Except for those moments where I wish I could just end his life. Bae, I'm hungry. Get me something. Ah. Uh... But he's still totally wrapped up in finishing his 10th burger. Until I nudged him that did he pay attention to his starving girlfriend. Aw, my bae is hungry. Then eat, my love. Ah. Uh... But what was it? I opened my eyes to find out he fed me his greasy finger. Ew! That definitely raised my hackles up. 
I stood up and gave him my tantrum, but he had the audacity to fight back. If Diana hadn't stopped me there, I swear I was going to give him some scratches. But still, we both had to settle down our first couple fight to continue our lovey-dovey girlfriend-boyfriend thing. Ugh. Things ran quite so smoothly that sometimes I thought I was in a real relationship. <laughs> then one day, I was walking in the schoolyard to hear some boys talking. Hey, Andrew and Cheryl have been together for two months, right? Yeah. I can't believe our spin the bottle trick that day could be that successful. Shout out to our handsome boy Andy who's willing to go into the lioness's den to help us earn some more allowance from our rich lady. Perfect. <laughs> and now the bait is taken, it's time to give Andrew the cue to action. What? So Andrew's offer only comes from an attempt of leeching onto me? How dare he? I immediately stormed away to find him, sit on a bench. Hi, Bay. Why the long face? Who stole your food? <laughs> Drop your act. I know you're just a gold digger. What gibberish are you talking about? I don't know what's going on with you, but don't put it on me. He still had the guts to deny it and even dared to go berserk at me. We're over. Not long after, he moved to another city with his family. Good riddance. And from that moment, I said no to boys as they only come to me for money. I didn't expect to see this jerk again, especially in this kind of situation. I dragged him outside. You have to stoop this low? Couldn't get my money, so now you asked your dad to steal from my aunt? Quit thinking everything has to spin around you just because you have some money. I just want my dad happy and he seemed to like your aunt. I warn you, don't cause any trouble. The next morning, I woke up to the most shocking news ever. Cheryl, Mr. Hardy and I are engaged. The wedding is soon to be decided and two families will move in together. What on earth? They've known each other for hardly two months and now they're getting married? What? This Hardy guy must have put some kind of spell on Juliana. Wait, so Andrew the jerk, he's my cousin now? No, I can't let him rob me one more time. I so needed some bestie talk right now. But why is Diana clinging to Andrew? I rushed over without a second thought. Hey, what's going on here? Are you blind? We're seeing each other now. What kind of gibberish did I just hear? I dragged Diana away immediately. You better have a proper reason. I, I'm sorry. You know too well what kind of person he is. Why? Um, can you do me a favor? You and Andrew are living under the same roof now, but can you keep a distance from him? What? Are you for real? You know, I'm a bit insecure. Okay, fine. You worry for nothing anyway. In no scenario do I want to be near him. What's wrong with the people around me? Frustrated, I came home, but to see Andrew's dad in my house. We just moved back to the city, so it's taking more time for our housing contract to settle. So we'll have to live in your place, just for now. Is it okay? Of course, Bay. This castle is too big for the two of us anyway. Right, Cheryl? Yeah, how convenient for you, Mr. Hardy. Just move in, and all this house and cars are all yours to use now. And that's how Andrew and his dad entered my life and made it miserable. Every single night, he kept bothering me with a screeching sound that I couldn't stay focused on studying. Stop it, or I'm gonna throw away your flute. Pity you can't comprehend art, cousin. Not just that. I had to share a bathroom with him, which now rather turned into his own exhibition of Star Wars obsession from towels, doormats, or even toothbrushes. Literally everything. Ugh. He even left his stinky football jersey for days. Ew. And of course, I couldn't let Andrew Invasion continue like that. I draw the boundary to set my territory. Hey, that's not fair. You got an inch more. What? Obviously not. And you know where he got his annoying nature from? Yeah, you guessed that right. His dad one day brought a full box of tools and left them everywhere in my house. Then he dragged every old item out of the basement and got them fixed. Hey, this castle wasn't supposed to be his mechanic shop and we have enough money to buy new stuff. One day I told Juliana my bed was too high and I wanted a new one. But Mr. Hardy was faster and insisted on fixing my bed. But when I lied on it, it collapsed immediately. Help, my butt! I just know it's his tactics to win Juliana's heart. And it seemed like it worked, as my aunt, who was never seen in the kitchen, now volunteered to show off her cooking skills. Wow, love's power, they say. Then let's see how love would burn. <laughs> I just happened to heat up their love by adding some super hot chili into Mr. Hardy's portion. And after the first bite, he ended up crying like a baby. Don't you know I have a peptic ulcer? Then he held his stomach and left the table. Juliana hurriedly followed him to the room, all looking concerned. New trick to wheedle some more gifts. Impressive. It's you, right? Me what? 
I ignored him and went back to my delicious sup, but this party pooper stole the dish and scoffed, like being left starving for decades. Okay, fine. If you insist, you just pushed all of my buttons, you moron. I snatched his dish and finished the steak in front of him, and I could see his eyes turned red in anger. And that's when the fork fight broke out between us, until the maids came in to prevent any more calamity. The next morning, I saw my aunt taking Mr. Hardy to the hospital. Oh, I didn't expect it to be that bad. Right then, a delivery man came. Oh my my! Wasn't it Green Day? My favorite band of all time? But this vinyl was rare. Not everyone could have this. Who, who bought it? It's mine. You? Hey cousin, can you pay for me? I spent all my money on game yesterday. <laughs> <sighs> Classic. Fine. I'll pay. To make up for the prank yesterday. Okay, but with a condition. I'll unbox the vinyl. We return to the living room and open the vinyl. The cool guitar riffs and engaging lyrics gives me chills every time. When my jam was playing, I sang it out loud like usual. And notice Andrew did too. And just like that, we sang together until the song ended. And we started to talk about Green Day non-stop. American Idiot was the best album ever written. Fight me. No, Andrew Idiot. Dookie was the one that established their name. You call me Idiot? Then you might listen to Dookie too much that turned you into a... Into... Cheryl Poopy as well. What? I'm Cheryl Cherry Bomb! Too much for spending time with this jerk this morning. His taste in music is okay, but his personality is definitely not. One day at school, while I was busy with my homework, suddenly a boy stormed in my place. Hey beauty, I get a dare. Would you mind giving me a kiss? What? I very, very mind! Get off me! But he still leaned towards and trying to press his dry as the bark of a tree lips on mine! Hello, my name is Dixie, and I have quite a peculiar story for you today. Shout out to Animated Story Show for telling my life story, so please like and subscribe to the channel. I used to have a perfect life. My mom is a lawyer for a top law firm, and she's rarely home, but my dad works from home. And together, we were the best team. And Dixie keeps running, and oh, oh, can she make it? Woo! Yes, she does! Woohoo! And she shoots and she scores! Oh my god, what is going on here? Today is our father daughter tournament. And guess who's winning? Well, this tournament is over. David, you cannot continue to raise our child like a rascal. Clean this place up and come help me make dinner, Dixie. My mom was a total killjoy. At dinner, I was excited to discuss my upcoming birthday with my mom and dad. I finally wrote down what I want. There is only one thing on the list. We have talked about this. You are not getting a sister. But why? Pretty please, mom. I promise I will help with the baby and I will even stop playing. No, we are not having any more kids. Write something else on your list. But mom, it's all I want. Then want something else. Come on, baby. There must be something else you want. A baby is quite a tall order. If you guys don't give me a sister, I'm going to go on a hunger strike until you listen to me. Suit yourself. Ugh, oh, I'm too tired for this. Now let me have my dinner in peace. Of course she wouldn't care, even if I starve myself. I went upstairs and screamed into my pillow. My mom was so impossible. Hey, honey, are you good? Your wife is killing me. Come on, baby, cut her some slack. Having a baby is a big deal, and it might not be a good time for your mom and me because of work and, er, uh, something else. What else? Of course, work is more important to her than us. Your mom might work a lot, but trust me, she loves you. And I have the perfect gift for your birthday. It is going to be amazing and better than a crying baby. I doubt that, but we will see. A few weeks later, on the eve of my 14th birthday, everything fell apart. I was in my room when I heard commotion downstairs. It must be Dad setting up decorations. But then I heard Dad and Mom yelling at each other, so I ran downstairs to see Mom sitting in the dark. Mom, why are you sitting here alone? Where's Dad? And why didn't he do my decorations? Honey, there is no easy way to tell you this, but your dad left us. We have been having issues for a while, and I tried to keep us together, baby, believe me. I tried, but he walked away. Liar! Liar! You are lying! My dad will never do that! I will call him right now, and he will tell me that you are lying! But mom wasn't lying. I called every day for weeks, and dad never picked up the phone. He was really gone. I couldn't believe it. How could he leave me without a goodbye? As if things weren't bad enough, my mother walked into my room one day wearing the most ridiculous country outfit. We are moving to the countryside. What? 
to the countryside? Why? I figured that being here in this house might be too much. And if we are going to heal, we need a fresh start. New job, new home, new life. And it's summertime, so you have plenty of time to settle before school starts. I am not leaving. What if dad comes back for me? He will not. I don't believe you. You're just trying to take me far away from him. Pack your things. We're leaving today. Mark my words. I will not move. I will not. But of course, mom's way or the highway. Honey, um, there is something I need to tell you about this place. Where we're going is my home. It's the place I grew up. Huh? You never talk about your home, and now all of a sudden we are moving there? I know it's weird, but it's a long story. But believe me, you will understand soon. And you're finally going to meet my sister, Rose. Sister? You have a sister and never told me? God, do I really know anything about you? Oh, well, we're here. I looked up, and I saw the whole farm spreading in front of my eyes. And that's Rose, your aunt. A woman almost as beautiful as my mother stood in the driveway holding a rake. I could immediately sense that she didn't like us. Well, well, look who it is. Why are you here? This is my home, Rose. I don't need to explain anything to you. Home! Please don't make me laugh. Your husband leaves and you remember that you have a home. That's rich. Hi, Auntie Rose. I'm excited to meet you. Sure. She just walked away and continued shoving hay. Rude. But Auntie Rose was more than rude. She was cruel. She never spoke to my mom and me. She always pretended like we didn't exist. And to make it worse, I tried to ask mom what happened between them, but she refused to tell me. Ugh, adults. Feeling a little suffocated one day, I took a walk to the lake when I felt something like a rock hit me. Ugh, what in the coconuts was that? Oh, so sorry. I, I didn't see you coming. I'm Callum. And you must be Dixie. Huh? How do you know who I am? This is a little town. We know everyone. So, how are you finding life away from the big city? It's horrible. Can't wait for my dad to come take me away from here. Yeah, about that, I'm really sorry. My dad left too, so I understand how you feel. Listen, I don't know who you are or what you think you know, but my dad didn't leave me, okay? He's just tied up with work. Okay, okay, don't walk away. I'm sorry. Come on, let's see who can skip rocks the farthest. I was so angry at this Callum guy and the rest of the stupid town for thinking my dad left. But the thought of going back to the Cold War at home, I'd much rather stay with him. Turned out, Callum was a breath of fresh air, and soon, we started spending more time together. One night, I was sleeping in my room when my mother walked into my room. Hey, honey, I know that so much of this has been difficult for you, so I brought someone to help. Meet Summer, your adopted sister. I couldn't believe it. For the first time in forever, I ran and hugged my mom. Thank you so much. I finally have a sister, a forever friend. Yes, we are going to be best friends, sister. Summer was just one year younger than me, but she was so energetic and full of adventure. Every morning, she would leave the room before I woke up to explore the grounds. And late at night, she would tell me all the tales of her adventure during the day. Best of all, Summer also didn't like Auntie Rose's attitude one bit. So at night, we would badmouth Rose behind our back until we fell asleep. It was so satisfying. I saw you with Callum today. Hubba hubba, he is so cute. Is he your boyfriend? Ew, no, we're just friends. Okay, if you say so. Guess what I did today? I left the barn doors open, and I'm sure all the animals have escaped by now. <laughs> what? Summer, why would you do that? Because Rose has been rude to us. All she cares about is those animals. And let's see what she does when the animals are all gone. Christ, that's terrible, Summer. Please don't do that ever again. Auntie Rose is going to be so mad at you. Almost as if it was on cue, I heard a barge on my door. Summer jumped and hid behind me. You rat! How dare you! I know you let the animals get out. You are so lucky I got there on time. If not, if not, what? Rose, how dare you threaten my child? Tell your little nuisance to stay away from my property, or I will deal with her. I could feel Summer shivering behind me, so I had to be a big sister and protect her. Auntie Rose, I am very sorry. It will never happen again. Auntie Rose just huffed and walked away. Phew, that was close. But after they all left my room, Summer started laughing. I warned her to never play silly pranks again, but I just knew that she would not listen to me. The next time I hung out with Callum, I told him what happened. Summer keeps playing pranks on Auntie Rose, 
I'm worried she's going to make Mom and Auntie Rose fight even more. Well, maybe she's just trying to adjust, and it's her own way of acting out. She has to get over it quickly because bitter Auntie Rose doesn't play. What's Summer like, by the way? She's sweet, but she's always busy going on her wildest adventures. <laughs> <laughs> When I got home that day, my mom and Auntie Rose were in a shouting match. I know my child, and she didn't do this. You can be mad at me all you want, but don't accuse my child of something she didn't do. Someone keyed my car. It's you, Dixie, isn't it? I... I didn't do it. I told you. Is this why you came here? To torture me? Haven't you done enough? After all these years, I can't believe that you came back to continue to cause me pain. Rose, please, no. Then Mom started to cry, too. Can you please tell me what happened between you guys? Enough with the secrecy. <laughs> when Rose and I were teenagers, she had a piggy bank where she saved money to get out of this place and start her life somewhere new. She never wanted to stay in the small town. But then one day, your grandparents expected me to take over the farm, and I panicked. So I stole her piggy bank, got on a train, and left. And because I left, Rose was stuck here with a farm. Ugh, I hate that I hurt my sister, but I don't regret it. If I didn't leave, I wouldn't have met your dad, and I wouldn't have had you. Oh my god! I can't believe you did that! That's why she hates us! You ruined her life! I know! That's why I came back. I want to fix things, but everyone I love hates me. Your dad, you, and my sister. Maybe I am just a terrible person. What you did was terrible, but... Uh, you are not terrible, Mom. But you have to apologize to Auntie Rose and do whatever it takes to make it up for her. I was happy Mom admitted her wrongdoing and wanted to make amends after all. So, we all had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation when Mom finally had the courage to apologize to Auntie Rose. She was still mad at first, but then... You know I resented you for many years, but because you left me with a farm, I realized how much I loved the land and eventually found my spiritual healing here. So in a way, I have to say thank you, and sorry for being mean to you. We all shared a warm embrace. It felt so good to be a family again. When I got back to my room, I was glad to see Summer there. Oh, thank God you're here. Where have you been the whole day? Busy wandering around plotting my new prank on Rose. You have to stop messing with Auntie Rose right now. She and Mom actually patched things up. Then I told her everything, but to my surprise, no, messing with her is fun, and I like it. If you don't stop, I'm going to tell everyone. You can try, but no one would believe you. I am the cute and cuddly one. Summer, why can't we just get along? Why do you have to break my heart, just like everyone else? Ask yourself. Don't put that onto me. I was so furious. What type of sister from hell was this? But she was right. No one was going to believe me unless I caught her in the act. But before I could do anything, I got carried away with the work at the farm. One day, Callum and I were helping Mom in the storage house when Auntie Rose ran in. Someone destroyed the chicken coop! Ran a tractor into it! What? That was it. I know who did it. It was Summer. She is the one who has been doing all of it, not me. I tried to take the fall for her and talk her out of it, but she is not listening to me. Rose looked at me like I was insane. You are a terrible liar. I know you did this. I have proof. She pulled out a video, and I felt like I was being sucker punched. It was me. I was driving the tractor. Then I crashed it and started laughing hysterically. No, that's not possible. I didn't do that. Summer did. Summer did all of it. I tried to fix it so Auntie Rose could forgive Mom, but she got upset with me and started doing more daring stuff. Sometimes I found her pranks and fixed them before you saw them, but I couldn't get it all. At this point, everyone was staring at me with so much concern in their eyes. Honey, who is Summer? Summer, my sister, the one you adopted. I, I didn't do that. You have no sister. Wait, I think I know what is happening. It makes sense now. Dixie, Summer is not real. You made her up. That's not true. You know her. I don't, actually. I never met her. Oh, my poor baby. You need help. I am not insane. It's okay, sweetheart. It's okay. Mom and Auntie Rose then drove me to the hospital, where I would be given therapy. Callum also came with us and sat with me in the waiting room. I can't even trust my brain again. I don't even know what's real anymore. Did I also imagine you too, Callum? No, you didn't. I am real, Dixie. And I will be here with you every step of the way. 
Right then, Mom and Auntie Rose came back after talking to the therapist. Dixie, honey, I'm so sorry for not listening to you and your needs for so long. I knew you always wanted a sister, but I never took you seriously. It was my fault. If I had been there for you, listened to you, and hadn't been so controlling and distant to you, things might have been different. But now I promise I will always be here with you, and you're going to be okay. I promise. W what about Summer? You don't need Summer. You have us. All of us. Long idling hours in class finally came to an end. Time to go home and chill. Huh? Are those thugs threatening a girl? Picking on the weak? Such cowards. Oops, she saw me. Now they're all looking at me. As a Muay Thai prodigy, I most definitely will run as fast as I can from danger. It's not me. My legs have a mind of their own. Besides, I stood no chance against those big, scary guys. I might get myself hurt if I tried to help. Then she'd call me a jumpy idiot. Yet, some part of me still wished I could do something. While I was pondering from afar, a guy charged at them out of nowhere, then knocked them all out. Looked like he knew martial arts. Like me. I'm Jamie, by the way, and my story's absolutely normal. Please like and subscribe. I didn't expect to see my dad home this early. Sweetie, you're back already. How's your day? Hi, Dad. All good. It's been just me and my dad since my mom passed away when I was little. He's the best dad I could ask for, but he's shunned by this entire town. He's one of the firefighters who reported to a tragic fire accident around a year ago. They managed to save many lives, but unfortunately there were casualties. After that, the fire department became the town's scapegoat just because they couldn't save everyone. However, I could see better than anyone how much my father had sacrificed. He always covered up his left arm and told me not to tell anybody about it. He considered it part of his job and still felt guilty about that tragedy. More importantly, he taught me to be willing to help others no matter what. Little Jamie did listen to him and was always helpful, but no matter how hard we tried, we still had to endure the townsfolk's woulda, coulda, shoulda nonsense. So I now live by my own rule. Don't be a hero. Hey, it helped Jesse Eisenberg's character survive Zombieland, so it'd surely get me through my life. And so the happy little girl now wears a permanent scowl on her face like her armor. Thanks to my tough exterior, no one would ever pick a fight with me or speak badly about me, at least not to my face. Side effects included having no friends, getting pushed around by teachers, and being brushed off most of the time. You know, the usual cold shoulder. The next day, I was enjoying a good old boring normal day when I suddenly was summoned to the principal's office. For bullying a fellow student? What? Turns out, the damsel in distress yesterday, Betty, reported everything to the principal while conveniently placing me in that gang. I tried explaining myself, but my efforts seemed to be futile. Can't say I'm surprised. Like father, like daughter, I am seriously concerned about my students' safety, especially since street violence reigns in this area lately. Such terrible behavior is even more serious coming from you than those imbeciles. Good heavens, I hadn't even touched a single strand of hair on anyone's head. Oof, she obviously is blaming me simply because I didn't help. But speaking the truth would be like adding fuel to the fire. I believe the proper punishment for you is immediate suspension for two weeks. No, sir, I can't be their accomplice because... Because I was going to start a self-defense club for girls. Just like you, I worry a great deal about multiple attacks recently. Therefore, I want to help them be prepared. I I was trying to recruit Betty, but she was surrounded by so many of them while I was all alone. That's like fighting a losing battle. I actually ran away so I could, um, report them to you. Betty must have mistaken me for one of them. My gibberish speech went on for a good while before he finally let me go. I had to bluff my way through as many questions. Where does the club take place? When? How many members? And since he said he'd come by sometimes, I actually had to create a self-defense club and begin recruiting. The first day of the club, only a few girls came. Fine, I don't have much care for this stuff anyway. It's merely an excuse for me to be let off the hook. I grabbed the two tallest girls, then asked them to demonstrate a couple moves so the rest could follow their lead. When an assailant strikes, cross your wrist to trap his arms. Jump and boom! Boom. Yeah, boom. Did I do that right, Jamie? Jamie? Yes, yes, uh, uh, that's it. Uh, don't be lazy, okay? Then I got back to scrolling on my phone and saw that Betty had gone public about the incident. Even someone as indifferent as me could see how much sympathy and attention Betty got after that. Her story's influence went beyond the internet when our school launched a No Bullies Allowed campaign and chose her to be the spokesperson. However, they could only propose outdated and ineffective measures, like always traveling in groups, bringing pocket knives or pepper spray, or giving in to not get any serious injury. None of which really helped, and more students fell victim. 
A few days later, right before English class, I saw the Good Samaritan that day. He's Aaron and transferred from another school in the area. Come to think of it, he's quite a heartthrob, which got all the girls all riled up. Do you have a girlfriend? What's your type? Sexy, cool, nerdy. I know, nice and sweet? Yes, yes. Oh, Mr. Bernardi's here. As usual, Mr. Bernardi began the lesson with a pop quiz. Today's topic was Hamlet. Okay, I knew this one. What's the play about, Teddy? Um, uh, a guy named Hamlet? Good, B+. Plus. Any other idea? Jamie? The play works on many levels. It's about Prince Hamlet's family conflict, their politics, how he can't make up his mind about duties, moral codes, and... Stop! F. You're reading too much into it. Well, I should have seen that coming. You suck. What did you say, Aaron Taylor? I said, aw, shucks. Wow, this guy's so much more than just a pretty face. When class was over, I came to thank him and even got his socials. He's a super handsome guy with a voice of an angel who defended me. I think I got, well, you know. Hmm, let's see what his social says about his type. Oh, Betty seemed to be getting more and more support, huh? I guess people have more compassion for delicate little flowers like her. <sighs> wow, nice. I had zero chance then. Suddenly, I heard a commotion outside, then peeked out to see my father dealing with rude neighbors. Man, I can't live the life of the local doormat anymore. If so, I had to change first. I can be like her. All right, starting today, call me Dainty Jamie? Ugh. I'll figure something out, but my life will surely be different. Aaron, your girlfriend is coming. I'll certainly need a new look to go with my new personality. The princess diary would be the perfect tutorial. First, I have to look like a princess. So I replaced my sneakers, hoodies, and t-shirts with high heels, short skirts, and all things pink and glittery. Of course, cute accessories are a must. Ting! But it would be lying if I said this new style was comfy. This morning, my long hair got caught in a keychain on my backpack. It was impossible to untangle, so I had to cut off a chunk of hair. You know what they say, pain is beauty. I went to school in my new style, and the moment I set foot in the building, people stared at me like I was an alien. Then the mocking began. Look who's talking. Last time I saw something like you, I flushed. Oh dear, that wasn't very ladylike. So I decided to change my tone to sound posh and even learned how to sit, stand, and pick up dropped items elegantly. Greetings, Mrs. Allen. Can I have mashed potatoes and beans, please? What's that? Speak up, young lady. I'm sorry. Can someone be a doll and help, please? But they just looked at me all judgy. <sighs> Stay calm. A lady doesn't panic. I slowly sat down with poise, but someone already picked up my tray. Aaron! He's freaky fast. Being a helpless pretty girl sure is nice. Jamie, you look different. <laughs> I've always looked like this, silly. Since then, we started having lunch together. I felt safe around him because he's new here and didn't know about my past. We gradually became close as we've had many things in common, like martial arts. I really wanted to let my geek flag fly high, but had to hold back. Still, it didn't mean he's used to the current me. Like, he'd not understand that I was trying to eat gracefully. Are you a slow eater or just picky? Give it to me. I was saving it for last. Also, he often brought me honey and lemon candy. Sweet! But that's because he thought my soft voice came from a sore throat. Erin, I was looking for you everywhere. Come, I want to show you something cool. Uh, we're kinda in the middle of something. Why are you always with her? Let me tell you, her father... Come here, you have to see this. What is it? Uh, well, um, flowers. Yeah, flowers. Aren't they pretty? You're weird. Like, in a good way, but weird. <laughs> Are you trying to hide an earth-shattering secret, like your true self? Am I wrong? No way. What else can I be but myself? You watch too many movies. <laughs> to keep up my fair lady appearance, I shouldn't come to the Fight Girl Club so frequently. Since the principal wasn't breathing down my neck anymore, I hadn't been there for the past two weeks. Meanwhile, I tried to talk to Aaron more often. He's very nice. A bit too nice, as in he literally took pleasure in helping others. Today, although we're supposed to walk home together, Aaron canceled at the last minute because, so sorry, Betty needed someone to walk her home, and today none of her friends could. How are you always in the mood to help people? Don't know. It's fun, I guess. Aren't you afraid your kindness will be taken for granted or getting you into trouble one day? Like my, well, never mind. Have fun. 
I'll make it up to you. Bye. I'm fine with that. It just stings because it's Betty. Actually, Aaron wouldn't think twice about assisting a complete stranger, let alone a classmate. Was I even a little bit special in his eyes? I want to come clean to him, yet I'm afraid that will only make him distrust me and leave me like everybody else. This uncertain hell is driving me insane. I'll ask him out to clear things up. Ugh, just a dumb text from my self-defense club. Delete! Eek! He said yes! That's a good sign. Sunday came, and after we bought our tickets, we saw a girl struggling with dozens of grocery bags. Oh, that's Pooja from school. Erin hurried over to help with the bags. We had some time before the movie started. We walked her back and found out that she's volunteering at a soup kitchen for homeless people. Thanks so much. You two are here anyway. Want to join us? We always need some help here. What? Free labor? No, Absolutely, no sorry. problem. We got tickets to a movie, right, Aaron? I don't think it's too late to change our plan, though. I had to pull him aside immediately. Aaron, what if we're too helpful so they keep us here until late? If not, we'll get yelled at. And if we leave early, they'll have something else to say. I don't know, maybe this isn't a good idea. Come now, so complicated. Just flat out say you don't want to help. Don't be ridiculous. It's our date, and we shouldn't let it go to waste. I'm ridiculous? Okay, but at least I'm not selfish and conceited. You don't want to feed the homeless? I'll stay and give them a hand. You can leave. Hey, what's the matter with you? Don't think you're better because you help everyone you see. Oh, so now we're being honest? Fine, my turn. I didn't listen to what everyone said about you and still became your friend. Turns out they're all right after all. Like father, like daughter. What are you talking about? You... You you knew everything? Yeah, I'm not dumb, and that's not all. Now I finally believe my dad died in that fire because of your dad's negligence. Then he stormed off, leaving me stunned. I could see he rolled up his sleeves and began happily working, while I was left out here with my heart broken. When I was figuring out what to do next, someone passed by. He was tall and handsome, just like a male character walking straight out of a Japanese manga. But why does it have to be in this embarrassing situation? After what feels like an eternity of bombastic side eyes, he finally got close to me, opened his bag, and pulled out an old pair of shoes. I was dreaming about how he would help me put them on, like in the movies when he coldly tossed the shoes next to me. That should do. Then he just left. Hey, you! Can't you at least help me get out of this? The guy sighed, then turned around to help me. Do you even know who I am? Of course I do, your highness. What's with that attitude of yours? The royal family never cared to visit this poor village. Why is your highness troubling herself here? Is that so? Well, if that's the case, I want you to show me around so I know how my people are doing, stranger. The guy seemed surprised at my request, but then put on the sweetest smile. My name's Will, and of course, I can give you a tour. Holy mother of God. If his judgy look was enough to make you question your self-worth, his smile could make you feel like you're the luckiest girl in the world. But before you can wander around, you need to blend in first. People here don't really like the members of the royalty. Then he gave me some old clothes from his bag. You can go in there. What? Do I look like I belong in there? No one's gonna judge you. Except some chickens, maybe. Hey, I can behead you in one second. I'm just kidding. You're safe in there. This was really the middle of the cornfield. So I had to go in and got changed quick. This Will guys better not be fooling around. And he did not. He walked me around and told me about the lives of the villagers here. I was shocked to see the houses in such poor conditions. How come I only see women and children here? Where are all the men? Young people, especially men, all went away trying to find jobs. (sighs) The living conditions here are hard. I see. But then, who helps take care of the kids and the elderly? We're all just a big family, so everyone kind of counts on each other to make it through. And you're the only guy around? Actually, I was going to leave too, but then I just didn't have the heart to, so I decided to stay here to take care of everyone. I was shocked to learn about everything, all this time while I was sheltered in my gated castle, attending useless events at the lodge in name of charity. People out here have been struggling, and this guy, Will, has done more for others than I ever did. I was wrong about him. Right then, a piercing voice came shaking the earth beneath my feet. Your Highness! What do you think you're doing? Oh my god, what kind of rocks are you dressed in? Are you trying to harm the princess? Guards, restrain him! No, 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 Grace, I'm fine! Look! The guards finally let go of Will. You can't be out here, princess. You have to return to the lodge ASAP before word gets out. Next thing I knew, I was escorted away. Thank you! I'll return the shoes to you! Man, Grace is always a party pooper. 
As soon as we got back to the lodge, Grace instantly turned into a talking machine, going on and on about how dangerous it was, how reckless I was. But you know, one of my greatest strengths is selective listening. So I take what she said with a spoon of salt. I mean, a grain of salt. (laughs) (sighs) Everything I just said to you goes in one ear and out the other, doesn't it? Yep, you got that right. (laughs) Anyway, I had this idea while cruising around the village. I want to help better the lives of the people there. What else, princess? I'm serious. It's like I finally found my life's purpose as a princess all these years. (sighs) Just don't get yourself into trouble is all I'm asking for. You got it. (laughs) That night, I racked my brain trying to think about how I could help the villagers. Uh Aha! I'll give them the nicest things in the world, just like how the fairy godmother helped Cinderella. So the next day, I ordered my servants to pack boxes of gifts to deliver to Will and the other villagers. If you could have anything from the royal family, what would you want? I'm so sorry, Princess. I don't know what I did wrong. Please don't fire me. Chill out. You're not fired. Just answer me. I I don't know. Maybe expensive clothes made out of cashmere or mulberry silk would be nice. Right. Pack all the royal gowns, then. From blueberry silk, of course. Princess, it, it's mulberry. Yeah, that. What else? Ah, get all my tiaras, too. But that's your tiaras, princess. Nah, I never wear them anyway. Oh, don't forget some royal tableware and tea sets, too. I want my people to have the most enjoyable dining experience. After having the gifts sent over, I also gave the order to build a tea house in the village where people could read and have a cup of tea together. <sighs> it feels so nice to finally be able to do some real charity. In the days following, I still had to resume my charity duties at the lodge, namely helping out with the laundry. But of course, it was just for photos. Feeling exhausted, I decided to get a massage with Liam and Grace afterwards. But who knows, it would tickle so much. (laughs) It's like a a thousand feathers poking at my souls. (laughs) Your Highness, are you okay? Looks like you're dying over there. (laughs) Help! (laughs) Help me! (laughs) Strangely, after the massage disaster, it was like something clicked among the three of us. We would hang out together and our favorite thing to do was spilling the tea about the royal family. Well, not literally. The queen mustn't know about this. Nah, it's fine. The queen always acts tough and strict, but did you guys know that she's actually scared of the microwave? (laughs) Your Highness! I heard some other rumors on the streets, too. A royal member once snatched a scar from a woman and never gave it back just because they liked it so much. Oh, I bet it's Princess Aurora. She's crazy about fashion and all that nonsense. We never get along, though. But just when a maid was putting down a spoon next to me, the butler suddenly flew off the handle. This is the dessert spoon, and that is the teaspoon. How could you not know this? I'm I'm terribly sorry, Princess. Uh, oh. It's just a spoon. You're excused. Don't worry about it. Agreed. We don't care about those stupid rules. Now, if you could leave us alone. They finally left. Ugh. I wonder if these people ever got bored of themselves being boring. Even though I had fun with Grace and Liam for the past couple of days, I've been longing to get out of the lodge again and explore the grounds. So one time, while Grace was back at the palace running some errands, I immediately took my golden opportunity. I was so excited to see how my people were doing with all the nice things I've sent to them. Oh, I bet they're looking as elegant as the royal family now. Maybe they're busy riding the horses I sent. Oh, actually, they might even be having a tea party now. I can't wait to join them. But when I got there... The village looks the same. And is that the Sovereign's orb they're playing with? No, 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 that's not a toy, and you're holding it upside down. That's when I turned to see, by the river, the woman pounding on the cloves with golden golf clubs from the late king. Just when I was heading towards them, I caught sight of the tea house, full of pigs, horses, and chickens inside. Did they seriously turn my elegant tea house into a barn? I guess the animals are having a grand tea party in there. Right then, some woman passing by noticed me. Is that the princess? I can't believe she still has the audacity to show up here. I thought she was different, but she's just like the rest of the royal family. A bunch of useless, ignorant snobs. They don't even know what we need. What's all the use in these luxuries when we can't even afford basic necessities? I felt like reality had smacked me in the face for the first time in my life. Turned out I wasn't helping them at all. Just then, I saw Will nearby. But upon seeing me, he just sighed and turned away to leave. Trust me, all I wanted was to help out, but I just don't know how. You should just go back to your lodge, princess. No, 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 let me stay here and live with everyone to understand what my people are going through. That's not possible. You grew up with abundance and wouldn't last a day here. 
That's why I want to learn, so I could really be helpful and give everyone what they need. Please help me, Will. He still seemed hesitant. Just treat me like everyone else here. I promise I'll try my best. Will seemed surprised at how determined I was, and he agreed to give me a chance. I was over the moon and ready to start a new venture. But when I got back to the lodge to pack my things, I was informed that the charity program was over and all of us were to return to the palace the next day. I had to go find Liam. Seeing him reading in the garden, I told him I had some emergency that needed my attention here and asked if he could help cover up for me. I was ready to get on my knees if I needed to when... Sure thing. Just do whatever you need to. But aren't you mad? I know I was supposed to be spending time with you just as the queen wanted me to. You know, the marriage and stuff. Girl, I got your back. Saying that, he got on the phone with my mom. Your majesty, the princess and I are enjoying our time together so much and wish to be allowed to extend our stays here. And of course, the queen was more than happy to agree. But I knew there was one more obstacle to overcome. Grace! When I told her I needed to live outside the lodge for a while, she immediately opposed the idea. I'm serious, Grace. I know you worry about me, but I am the princess. I'm supposed to help the very people I rule, but I failed to do that so far. And I'm here enjoying my privileges on my people's hard work. What kind of princess am I? Plus, Liam and I don't have feelings for each other anyway. Grace, you gotta help me. After long hours of arguing, Grace finally caved. I was so ecstatic that I jumped over to hug her. Giddy up! Only, life in the village was slightly different from the palace. People here actually grow their own food. Doesn't everyone's food come from the store? <laughs> no, we don't have stores here. Everything comes from the ground. Even my afternoon chocolate shake with two pumps of mocha? Yes, even your chocolate shake with two pumps of mocha. <laughs> in fact, I bet it's even better. I'll make one for you later. Just then, I saw Mrs. Estelle struggling to pluck up the carrots, so I came over to help her. Don't you worry, I got this. But, uh, uh, who knew the carrot was holding on to dear ground? Just when I was about to give up, it suddenly came off the ground and ended up flying straight over my head, hitting Will. Um, maybe it's better you go feed the chicken. But when I approached the chicken, I saw an egg on the ground, so I picked it up. The chicken suddenly turned to look at me as if they all spotted their sworn enemy. All that was left to do was run! Not until Will came in and saved the day did all the chickens calm themselves down. You seem to know a lot about life here. Of course, I've lived here since the day I was born, though I don't really know who my parents are. Where are your parents? I'm actually an orphan, being brought up by the people here. They didn't have much, but were raising me with all their hearts. That's why I want to stay here and take care of them now that they're getting older. I was touched by his story and realized how nice people could be to each other, against all odds. Let's go fix the roofs. The storm's coming. Is there something you can't do, Mr. Know-it-all? Well, actually, yes. I've been living here for so long, I don't know how to... How to impress a girl. <laughs> Who are you kidding? I bet girls are dying to sweep you off your feet already. Are you? For a second, I found myself lost in the dreamy haze of his eyes. No, no, Mia, you're here to help others, not to fool around. Come on, let's go fix the roofs. Later that day, Will led me to the garden and showed me the traditional way of making chocolate. And just like this, you keep grinding until it becomes a thick paste. I got to try it with Will holding my hand. The two of us were so close together. I could hear my heart pounding against my chest. Is this the rush they all talked about in the fairy tales? When we finished, Will made a fresh batch of hot chocolate and gave me one. When I took a sip, a rich, nutty, and earthy flavor instantly warmed me up inside. Will was right. This is better than any Starbucks I ever had. The following days were the most fun I've had in my entire life. I still found it hard to navigate through the hardships here. But Will was always by my side. And the people here, once I got to know them better, they all started to warm up to me too. Every Friday, the whole village would gather around a bonfire to tell each other the oldest tales. Enough with the nightingale. I want to know when we'll hear the happy ending for the tale of Mir and Will. <laughs> We all know the happy ending is as clear as day already. <laughs> I found my cheeks warming up to the jokes. I wondered what was on his mind as I caught Will blushing also. Everything was like a dream, until one morning Will and the other villagers had to go harvest the crop, and I stayed home to help with some chores. While I was hanging the clothes, I got all shook up by a familiar voice. What do you think you're doing, Mia? 